Yeah, welcome to the Plans Committee meeting for the, of the 12th of January. Um, before we start, I'll get the committee to introduce themselves. Uh, <clears throat> start with myself. I'm Councillor Chris Leather, chair of the meeting, and I represent Northern. And I'll start there with Councillor Craig. Hi, I'm Ruth Craigie, and I represent Philippe East. Good morning, my name's uh, Dermot Forgot, and I represent Philippe North. Morning. My name is Peter Christie. I represent uh, Pittsburgh North as well. Yeah, Pete Watson. I represent Brody. Morning. I'm, I'm Richard Bath. I represent Harvard North. Good morning. My name is Rosie Lock, and I represent Two Rivers and Three Boards. Good morning, Richard Wiseman. I represent the Chevrolet and Langtree Ward. And if I can get the officers sat here, and then the officers who are present to introduce themselves. Start with our planning manager. Good morning, members. Good morning, members of the public. My name is Sean Harrington. I'm the planning manager of Torres District Council. Good morning. My name is Stacey Dory. I'm the head of legal and governance of Torres District Council. Good morning, members. My name is Tracy Blackmore. I'm the development manager of the media. Good morning. Michael Newcomb from Devon Highlands. Good morning. I'm Helen Montgomery, project engineer at Devon Council. Good morning. Matt Collins, Devon County Council Highlands. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> We're not expecting any fire drill this morning, so if the alarm goes off, please make your way out the way that you came in, but don't use the lift. Somebody will take them all of it down. We still got an in the chair. Can this be turned up a bit? We didn't hear a lot of them come over there, right? No, we didn't hear anyone from over there. We got full work. We have got lorries. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I need to just bring it a little bit closer. Well, I just sitting like that. <laughs> not very good, this system, to be honest. Uh, yeah, we're not expecting a fire drill this morning. Um, so if, if we have to leave, if the alarm goes off, please go out the way you came in and down the stairs, but don't use the lift. Right. Item one on the agenda then is apologies for absence. So I think we've got a full compliment this morning. Yeah, no apologies. No apologies, thank you. And item two uh, on the agenda is the minutes of our last meeting on the 2nd of December, and they're on pages five to nine. And I'll move those from the chair if someone would like to set them. Okay. Councillor Watson seconded them. Could you take a vote on those, please? Councillor Barrison. Four. Councillor Brown. Four. Councillor Christie. Four. Councillor Craigie. Four. Councillor Leather. Four. Councillor Locke. Abstain. I was absent. Thank you. Councillor McGough. Abstain. Councillor Watson. Four. Councillor Wiseman. Four. Thank you. That's seven for care and two abstentions. Thank you. Item three on the agenda is declarations of interest. Members with interest to declare should refer to the agenda item and describe the nature of their interest when that item is being considered. Elected members of Devon County Council and town and parish councils who've considered a planning application by virtue of their membership of that council hold a personal interest and are deemed to have considered the application separately. And the express views of that council do not bind the members concerned who consider the application afresh. Item four is agreements of, of the agenda between parts one and two. There is no part two to the meeting. Item five is urgent matters to be brought forward. I have no urgent matters. The planning manager has either. Right, item six is public participation. This is where I invite, uh, advise the committee of any prior request to speak made by members of the public and to advise of the de details of the council's public participation scheme. Well, we have got 
for the first one, uh, the lands, land that counts down industrial part. Uh, Christopher Young, who's going to speak against, he sent a letter in which will be read by the planning manager. Also for the land that counts down industrial park application, Jonathan Chick, who is a supporter of the agent. The other speakers listed are for the Abbotson Road application. Brian Sims, a member of the public, will speak against that. Uh, again, the land north of Abbotson Road. Christina Trubrace uh, is speaking against. Again, a letter has been sent in, which will be read by the planning manager. And again, for the land north of Abbotson Road, Stuart Carville in support, who's the applicant. And then the final one is the land off Caddywell Lane in Torrington. James Shuttleworth, member of the public, objecting to that application, again has sent a letter in, which will be read by the planning manager. And the order of speakers are that uh, the planning officer will give their presentation of the application. Any town or parish councillor who wishes to speak for or against the application, they're given three minutes to speak. And then up to two members of the public, speakers who wish to speak against an application, they have three minutes each. And then there are two members of the public who can speak in support of an application. They also have three minutes each. And finally, any Torres District Council member from the ward in which the application falls, and there is no time limit on that ward member speaking to an application. So that concludes the public petition part of the agenda. Item seven is the planning applications. The information, recommend, recommendations and advice contained in the reports are correct at the date of preparation, which is more than 10 days in advance of the committee meeting. Due to these time constraints, any changes or necessary updates to the reports will be provided in writing or orally at the committee meeting. So now we move on to our first 7A application on pages 10 to 96 of your agenda, uh, the reports there. And um, the planning manager is going to present this application. Councillor Christie. Yeah, I'm dual hatted on this one. And I've got to also explain on the extreme east, um, there's an area of allotments. Um, this borders the site. Uh, the land is owned by the British Trust, I'm the British trustee, and it's rented by a bit of the town council. I'll start the town council, but I've got no financial interest. You know, I come to it with an open mind. Thanks for that, Councillor Christie. Good morning, members. Can you hear me clearly? No. <coughs> Any better? <coughs> yes. Yeah, I've got to be very close to the microphone. So this, members, is application <coughs> one slash zero six five six slash twenty twenty slash OUTM. If my voice fades in and out, please let me know, and I'll try to speak clearer. It's an outline application for up to 211 dwellings with up to 4.27 hectares of commercial land and the use classes B2, B8 and EG, public open space and other associated infrastructure with all matters reserved except access. Therefore, matters of appearance, landscaping, layout and scale would be considered, considered at later date at the reserved matters application. Before I commence with the body of the presentation, there are a couple of verbal updates to give to members. The first one is that a late representation has been received, um, which has been uploaded uh, to the website. Uh, this representation raises matters of consultation um, in that the uh, representation did, uh, hadn't realized the application had been submitted. General planning considerations. <clears throat> The scope of the application in terms of inclusion of an access road up to Buckland Road, opposed to the employment land, and concerns about noise and disturbance. It's considered that these matters have been considered within your officer's report. There's also an amendment to condition seven, 
which is page 55 of your committee report. Um, and it's a simple typo. It should read to the adjacent of the allocated bid 09 site as opposed to bid 07. Um, so if the uh, decision from committee was in line with officer recommendation, we'd have to seek a amendment to that condition just to reflect that amendment. The third verbal update is in relation to Appendix 1, which is the viability report, the district value of viability report. And it's a matter of disregarding paragraph 13.2 of that report, which is on page 67 of the committee, which has been included in error, um, which was hopefully pointed out by a member. So moving on to the, uh, the bulk of the presentation. As members can see in front of them, this is a location plan uh, of the site. Members have had the benefit of a comprehensive virtual site visit, uh, so it should be well aware of the site and the uh, environs of that site. It occupy, occupies approximately 19.9 .9 hectares of agricultural land, which is largely late to pasture and incorporates a number of existing hedgerows and trees along the perimeter and inside the site. The site is not within a protected landscape, and there are no triple SI designations or European wildlife designations on or around the site. So in front of members now is a context location of the site. Um, I'm sure members are well aware of the site as it's fairly close to where we're all sat now. It's to the south of Biddyford um, and directly adjacent to Castown Industrial Estate. This is a copy of the policies map of the adopted North Devon Torridge local plan. Um, as you can see, the allocation for the site is the area hatched um, on the plan in front of you, whilst the area in the purple pink color adjacent is the adjacent allocated site, bid 09, which does benefit from an outline planning commission. And there is a reserve matters application uh, for consideration with the authority um, at the moment. As members will see from that hatching, the allocation does also include the uh, Atlantic Rec Center and the Recycling Center, which have um, already been delivered. So more of a site context. Um, from this plan, members can see, and this was at the site visit, uh, members can see the context of the surrounding landforms and also the watercourses that run around through the site. And if I can just zoom in on that. Let's make it clearer for members. So surrounding the site, we have Castown Industrial State, Industrial Park to the north. To the east, we have the allotment area, as Councillor Christie mentioned, number two there. Buckley Road, bordering the site to the south. Blue Water Course and Woodland to the far western side of the site. The allocated sites, um, which the adjacent allocated sites shown in the hatch. And this plan shows the landscape strategy areas for the site. And essentially, the, uh, the pink areas are the most visibly exposed areas, um, with the sort of the yellow beige area being the most contained area. Uh, this just goes to show the topography of the site, which I'm sure members are aware of from the site visit, um, which broadly speaking um, runs north to south, but it is an undulating land <coughs> uh, with the site dropping off quite significantly to the south, the south the southern boundary of that site. A landscape visual impact assessment um, has been submitted with the application and accompanies the application. Um, which uh, has been put down to members and it's online um, for members to uh, view. The outcome of that visual assessment indicates that the, uh, the main clear view of the site from surrounding highways and road network is from the south. And there will be a few photographs later on the presentation to that. Um, to the north, east and west, there are occasional glimpse views um, with the most prominent view, like I say, being from the south due to that landfall. As mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the application is an outline, um, except for access. 
Therefore, any plans for the application are indicative at this stage. Although the plans have been fairly thoroughly worked up, so it does give a very clear indication to officers and members of the likely layout of the site. But as I say, it is indicative. So just running through the site, it's proposed uh, indicatively that the commercial land could uh, be directly to the south of the industrial site, with an area of residential to the east and to the south. Members should be aware of the linking road at Spine Road uh, to, from the east to the west boundary, again linking to the adjacent allocated site. Access to the north of the site onto Clavelli Road via a roundabout, which we'll come on to in a second, which is detailed. So that is for consideration. And also continuation of the access from Cadstown Industrial Estate um, just to the south of where we sat at the moment uh, via the tennis centre, Passer Tennis Centre. The indicative plan also shows um, attenuation and drainage as well as the open space strategy and a landscape strategy, again, indicative. Moving on to some photographs of the site. Uh, so these photographs are on the site, uh, with views south. Um, members will note that this site is later pasture um, and the topography of the site <coughs> sloping down towards the south. Now this is a view north towards Clavelli Road, and this is a area of land where the access would run. And on the photograph there on the right, members will be able to see the rooftops of bungalows that are along Clavelli Road. Uh, views west from the site, uh, in the distance, uh, you'll be able to see the green roof of the tennis centre. So just to get your bearings from the site. Viewed north and beyond this hedge bank is the recycling center. So again, it gives you an indication of that boundary treatment to the recycling center. Uh, photographs of the woodland to the west of the site, uh, which will be retained and that's protected by condition, as you'll note in your officer's report. Um, some photographs from the very south of the site, looking south towards Janet's Cottage, which is grade two listed, I'll come on to that in a second, um, just to indicate the intervisibility of that, um, you'll just be able to see the chimney stack through the, uh, the tree line there, which is just rendered, um, give you indication of the site levels as well. Uh, views north from the site, again, uh, to give an appreciation of that sloping topography of this area of the site. And the photograph on the right, um, facing towards the tennis centre and beyond that, uh, the Castile Industrial Estate and the actual building we're in now. As indicated earlier, um, from the landscape visual uh, impact assessment, the long distance views are limited. Um, however, there are clear views of the site from the south. Um, and particular on this viewpoint, uh, which was highlighted in the virtual site visit. And if I can zoom in, the site is there in this sort of two triangular field, really, um, there in the center of the view now. Uh, Buckland Road runs to the south of the site. And these photographs just give a character of Buckland Road. Um, it is very rural in character, a uh, single lane highway um, with the existing main access to the site um, being to the northeast of the site, uh, as shown by that plate. So, a few views of Clavelli Road. <laughs> Again, I'm sure members are, are very aware of Clavelli Road and its character. Um, this is a view facing west uh, with existing dwellings um, to the right hand side of the photograph, and the access will be to the left. And this will be the roundabout access, which we'll come on to in a second. Again, a better view of where the access point will be. Uh, members may be able to see just in the distance the Howden's building, uh, which is on the Castle Industrial Estate.
And then a view facing um, to the eastern direction um, with the access point through roundabouts uh, to the right hand side of the ground and the dwellings to the left. Um, Membership of the width of the valley road and the width of the pavement, the distance between those dwellings um, and the site. And moving on to the access, which will be via Castell. Um, just a few photographs of this road, uh, which runs past the uh, tennis centre. Uh, top left is the one that's the far south, uh, which will link down to the site. Uh, with the bottom right photograph, the indication of the link that will go towards um, the, uh, the adjacent allocated site. So just moving on to the detailed plans, I said access is detailed. Uh, in front of members is the plans for the proposed roundabout. Um, we do have Matt Collins from Devon County Council Highways party with us today if there are any questions about this. Um, but the roundabout has been considered, um, has been subject to uh, audit assessment and is considered suitable um, for the access required. Um, quick plan of the green infrastructure. Again, this is indicative at this stage. Um, I'll come on to the detailed considerations of this uh, in a second, uh, but just so members can understand how the green infrastructure, infrastructure strategy could, could be achieved on that side. And there's also a tree removal and retention plan. Um, so if you site and members will be aware from the committee report that there are conditions uh, ensuring that uh, trees are retained and protected during construction. Um, also a landscape strategy, uh, again indicating how a landscape strategy could be employed on the site given the quantum of uh, development proposed. Again, landscape would form a matter of reserve matters. And finally, before we come on to considerations, uh, the drainage strategy um, that's been employed and that has been considered by Devon County Council as well. Um, again, there are conditions uh, put forward in the officer's report um, requiring details of this to be submitted. <clears throat> So moving on to the uh, main plan considerations of relevance, can members still hear me clearly? Yeah. So in terms of principal development, in policy terms, the entire site is located within the development boundary for Biddyford, and policy STO6 of the adopted local plan identifies Biddyford as a strategic centre which will provide a focus for housing and employment development. The application site forms the majority of an allocation for housing and commercial development as prescribed within policy BID 05. <clears throat> BID 05, the text of BID 05 is included in your committee report, so I won't repeat that. Um, however, some parts of BID 05 I will, in relation, I'll highlight in relation to the requirement of eight hectares of employment space and approximately 130 dwellings, as well as the formation of an east west aligned vehicle link. There are some site specific um, development principles included in the policy, including strategic landscaping, area of green infrastructure, integrated transport connections to neighboring areas, appropriate design, and noise mitigation measures. It is noted that part of the commercial element of the application has already been developed um, by way of construction of a land center and recycling center. And as such, following revised proposals being submitted and negotiation with your officers, the proposal has now been increased and would result in a total amount of 6.62 hectares being provided. This is clearly less than the desired amount of eight hectares as articulated within the allocation policy. As well as the reduction in commercial land, the proposed number of residential units of 211 and that exceeds the numbers of units specified within bid 05, which is to say approximately 130 dwellings. An initial housing mix has been put forward, which results in an over provision of four and five bed units when considered against the council's housing and economic needs assessment. However, this is an indicative mix and a condition is recommended in the officer's report 
to allow housing mix to be considered at reserve matter stage when detailed designs are submitted, which is the best um, the best place to actually consider those that housing mix. Members will be aware of the lack of five-year housing land supply, and it is considered that there is a conflict with policy bid 05. However, there are clear benefits associated with the proposal, which meet some of those policy aims. The decision maker needs, in this case, to consider the MPPS requirement to grant permission unless any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits, the so-called tilted balance. I will return to this matter uh, later on in my presentation in terms of that time balance at the end. Moving on to design and impact on landscape character. <clears throat> the application is made in outline with only access to determination. Um, therefore, as I've stated, matters of layout, scale, external appearance and landscaping will be for that later consideration. Notwithstanding this, the application is supported by an illustrative master plan, which seeks to demonstrate that an acceptable layout can be achieved at detailed stage. Were 211 dwellings to come forward, this would represent a density of around 29 dwellings per hectare. This is considered appropriate for an allocated site and with reference to the prevailing character of the area and the surrounding residential in this area. The indicative master plan proposes commercial development to the north adjoining the existing industrial estate in order to limit the perceived visual impact of this element within the wider views to the south with two larger pockets of residential being to the east and to the west. <clears throat> the landscape visual appraisal, which accompanies the application, considers likely effects on landscape character and visual amenity. As expected, given the change of the site from greenfield to residential, a moderate level of effect is anticipated with regard to the site itself. And in terms of the wider landscape character, a moderate minor level of effect is expected. With respect to the effects on visual amenity, effects on road users are found to be limited to minor road routes, um, as demonstrated in the photographs to the south, and generally only available where gaps occur in well maintained uh, roadside devil hedge banks. Um, and the only real exception to this is being Clavelli Road, of course, where the roundabout uh, would be a significant impact uh, to that visual character of Clavelli Road. The application, whilst an outline, promotes a clear design vision. Inevitably, the character of the locality will change from open green fields to a mixed development, including both commercial and housing development. A balance has to be struck between achieving the housing numbers needed to meet the five-year land supply, meeting the requirement for commercial development, and also minimising the visual impact on the landscape. A certain density is required for effective use of land, which in itself is a scarce, a scarce resource. Uh, further assessment of the impact of the precise scale, massing and design of the new dwellings would be undertaken at reserve mass stage. Moving on to the impact on residential amenities. Uh, dwellings along the Valley Road uh, are the closest dwellings to the proposal, um, as well as Janet's cottage to the south of the site. Whilst it is not considered that would be a significant impact on the amenities of the residential dwellings, the amenities of the existing residential dwelling, should I say, uh, the amenities of the intended occupiers of dwellings on the development also need to be considered. The Environmental Protection Officer has considered the proposal with particular attention directed to the relationship between existing and proposed commercial buildings on the site. Whilst in an outline form, the Environmental Protection Officer concurs that noise simulation measures are available that can be introduced to development and should prefer, prevent significant adverse impact from noise. And the imposition of conditions have been recommended as per new officer report. In terms of air quality, an air quality and odour assessment has been submitted. And this has identified two potential neighbouring sources, um, which are reported not being significant. Um, given the separation distances, it is considered unlikely that there is an adverse impact will arise. Choose potential, um, potential impacts on surrounding area dune construction. A construction environment management plan is required, and that is subject to condition. Um, and at, at this outline stage, it is not considered that the coast event will result in a harmful impact on residential amenities um, of existing neighbouring occupiers, um, given the proximity of those neighbouring occupiers and topography of the site. Moving on to access and highways. The main vehicular access point, as we have seen, um, is from a roundabout uh, from Clavelli Road to the north of the site, 
with the commercial element being accessed by a farm road, which is an existing road by a cast iron industrial estate, and via the Atlantic Rapid Centre. The proposed roundabout is a significant element of highway infrastructure, which seeks to provide the required safe, safe access to the site. Whilst the layout is currently indicative, due to the outline nature of the application, pedestrian and cycling facilities are provided throughout the site and it is noted that the site is in a sustainable location with many facilities within walking distances. Following initial objections raised by Devon County Council as Highway Authority, further discussions have taken place in terms of the roundabout design and the stage one road safety audit has been submitted. The Highway Authority now consider the amended roundabout design and capacity analysis, including consideration of seasonal variation is acceptable and shows that the proposed access will operate acceptably in the future without severe impact. Bid 05, as I mentioned earlier, requires that an integrated highway network is um, provided, and also the formation of an east-west vehicle link as part of a wider distributor road uh, from the adjacent allocated site. And this is also provided uh, within the indicative layout and is protected by a condition, again, in your officer's report. The site is bounded to the west by a unclassified county road, uh, Scratch Face Lane, which is unsuitable for domestic or commercial vehicle use, and it should be retained for pedestrian and off-road cycle use. Uh, the proposal does not seek to utilise um, this route for any vehicle use, aside from a future link across the route to the allocated development uh, site to the west, which again is required by the policy. The design and access statement indicates that parking provision is provided across the site in a variety of forms, predominantly on plot. Um, however, the exact parking provision will be confirmed at reserve matter stage. Moving on to heritage and archaeology, there are no listed buildings within the site, that is not located within the conservation area. Consideration of the potential impact of the scheme on the adjacent Grade 2 listed Genix cottage and also the Grade 2 listed bridge, Genix Bridge, uh, have been considered. Which is located approximately 30 metres to the south of the site. The must plan indicates that the land within the southern part of the application area nearest to the properties is proposed for attenuation features and public open space. The existing woodland along and beyond the southern and southwestern boundaries of the site will also be retained. Only limited intervisibility is available, and which does limit that impact. The proposal, subject to reserve matters, is unlikely to have any impact um, on the aspects of setting that contributes to the significance of the Grade 2 listed Genesis Cottage or the listed bridge, or upon any key views that allow the significance of these aspects to be appreciated. Moving on to archaeology, um, development lies in an area of archaeological potential. Um, and members will be aware from the site visit that there is evidence of um, trial pits being dug. And that was part of a program of intrusive field evaluation that has been carried out. And the county archaeologist has received the interim summary of these results. The archaeologist has stated that whilst uh, post development contains evidence of prehistoric settlement, the evidence has been truncated by centuries of agricultural activity. And the nature of the, of the archaeological deposits investigated by the field evaluation do not appear to be of such significance that the archaeologist would advise preservation in situ. Moving on to drainage, um, as shown in the presentation, um, there was a flood risk assessment and a drainage strategy submitted for the application. The site lies within flood zone one, and therefore there's low probability of flooding from fluvial and tidal sources. The proposal seeks that discharge uh, from the site to be restricted to the greenfield uh, based on the proposed impermeable areas, and the FRA has demonstrated the proposed development would not increase flood risk to the site or the surrounding area. In terms of foul drainage, foul water is to be conveyed to a pump station located at the lowest point on the site, and from here pumped up to southwest waters, foul sewer located at Clavelli Road. Uh, southwest water have um, considered the application and have confirmed that there is sufficient capacity for the proposed foul loads. Uh, from 211 dwellings and the site. Um, Devon County Council, as the local flood authority, have no intensive objections, uh, providing conditions are imposed requiring submission of detail prior or as part of reserve matters. And again, that's a condition that's on your um, report. 
Moving on to ecology and trees, uh, Natural England has considered matters including impact on designated sites, uh, protect the landscape, biodiversity. No objections have been raised uh, subject to mitigation measures, an agricultural impact assessment and ecological impact assessment, and tree retention and removal plan accompanying the application. Um, and whilst the application is an outline, uh, the agricultural impact assessment assesses the impact on the tree stock from the proposed development and demonstrates which trees can be retained and which can be removed. It is noted um, that there will be loss of trees um, with two with the layouts that's indicative of two, loss of, um, two trees being totally lost with a partial loss of a further 13 items, which is to be mitigated uh, with new planting to ensure succession of the existing tree stock. And new planting has potential for longevity within the landscape and enhances species diversity for the site. In terms of delivery of biodiversity net gain, the, the net gain assessment identifies that there will be a loss of 11.57% in terms of habitats, a gain of 10% in terms of hedgerow, and a gain of 12.93% in terms of rivers. In order to deliver the 10% biodiversity net gain required by a policy, um, off-site habitat creation is proposed, given the potential 11% uh, loss in habitat um, units. And this will be undertaken at strategic location in consideration of the North Devon Biosphere Reserve Manager. The offsetting is considered consistent with requirements of policy DM08 mm -hmm. um, and has been agreed uh, with Natural England, who raised no concern. In terms of green infrastructure, a green infrastructure plan has been submitted as shown in the presentation. Um, and it shows how the um, various typologies of biological policy can be met and provided on site. Uh, this does show a significant over provision of amenity in natural green space, um, although it's noted that it's calculated to include the attenuation features of some 1.33 hectares. Location of the various typologies are well distributed throughout the site, uh, given, but given the outline nature of the site, it is recommended that provision of required typologies and future maintenance arrangements will be secured by a section 106 agreement. <coughs> Almost there, members. Uh, just moving on to viability and section 106. Um, the proposal will secure a comprehensive number of section 106 financial obligations as detailed in your committee report of over 1.2 million pounds, including contribution, contribution to education, uh, which includes SEN, primary, early years and land provision, NHS, um, CCG and library service. Um, all the figures for that are provided within your committee report. The applicant has submitted a viability appraisal that demonstrates that with a policy compliant level contributions, the development would be unviable. The district valuation office has been instructed um, by the district council to independently verify the submitted viability information. And the assigned DB officer has provided a written report to the council, which is appended to your committee report. The DB officer concurs with the applicant's contention that the scheme as proposed cannot provide um, a policy compliant amount of the uh, Section 106 contributions. However, he also concludes that the scheme can provide more affordable housing than originally put forward. Um, following negotiations, the applicant has agreed to the additionality of the affordable housing, which then results in 13 units of on site affordable housing being viable or being provided as opposed to the previously put forward 11. And that's together with all other, all other Section 106 contributions. So Section 106 package will include all financial contributions um, as previously stated, as well as 13 units of on-site affordable housing, um, which in percentage terms is just over 6%. The DV officer further recommends that a Section 116 agreement uh, includes a provision of a viability review. Um, and this is something that your officers recommend as well. And the applicant has accepted the conclusions of the uh, district valuer, agreed to the increase in affordable housing um, together with all of those section 106 contributions. It is disappointing to officers that due to viability issues, the proposal is unable to achieve a policy compliance number of affordable dwellings or the desired balance of commercial land and housing. 
However, given the independently assessed viability position and the additional infrastructure that disposal will be providing, which is including but not restricted to the new spine road, roundabout junction and service commercial land, the section 106 package is accepted by your officers. So finally, moving on to the planning balance. Um, as stated, we can't we can currently demonstrate a five-year supply of housing lands that meets the needs of the district. As such, there's a need to apply the assumption in favour of sustainable development as a material consideration in determining planning applications. The decision takers will therefore need to consider the MPPS requirement to grant planning permission unless any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. I know members are well versed in the tooth balance um, now. The balance of the benefits of the proposal against the adverse impacts are carefully detailed within your officer's committee report. The proposal does, however, depart from the housing and commercial land balance stipulated within policy bid 05, and this is considered within that wider plan balance, uh, planning balance as laid out in the committee report. Your officers are also disappointed that the balance between housing and commercial land does not meet the required policy bid 05. Um, and as I stated, the housing provision, the high affordable housing provision is below that expected. However, in weighing that identified harm against the benefits, it's considered that the adverse impacts associated with the development fail to significantly and demonstrably outweigh those benefits. The results being, when assessed against the policies in the North Devon Entitled Local Plan as a whole and the MPPF, and having considered all the planning issues and the material considerations, on balance, a recommendation for approval was made, subject to the conditions laid out in your officer's report, and a section 106 being entered into, again, with heads of terms as detailed in the committee report. That concludes my presentation. Just so that members are aware, we do have some um, officers with us today. Pete McGuggan from the Evaluation Office, um, if members have any questions about the viability. Uh, Matt Collins from Devon County Council um, Highways and also Chris Fuller uh, from Torsten Council on the economic development perspective. Thank you, members. Thank you, Sean, for that long and very comprehensive presentation of that application. I'll give you time to get your breath back in the <clears throat> Have a drink because our first speaker or contribution uh, against the application is a letter which is to be read out by our planning manager. So, Christopher Young again <laughs> sent a letter in which Sean will read out. Thank you, Chair. Can you remember to hear me still? Yeah, it's still on. Yeah, good. Um, so, this is a representation or a statement uh, supplied by Christopher Young of 28 Oaklands, um, Biddyford. My property in Oaklands has a boundary of Clavelli Road. My western fence on the wooden side is shown on the new roundabout drawing with a north point upon it. The position of the new roundabout is one that affects my property as Clavelli Road begins to move to the right in line with my fence, which is shown on the design plan. Yeah. Yeah, I think this microphone keeps... <laughs> I'll start again, members. <coughs> My property in Oaklands has a boundary of Clavelli Road. My western fence on the wooden side is shown on the new roundabout drawing with a north point on it. The position on the new roundabout is one that affects my property as Clavelli Road begins to move to the right in line with my fence, which is shown on the design plan. This is a major difference to that shown on the consultation plan. The removal of more of the historic Stukley Hedge on the south side concerns me, as at present it shields us from the Howden's warehouse and I hope all of the hedge behind Howden's will remain. I understand the new cycle footpath on the southern side will still be behind the hedge, but the existing footpath on our north side of the Valley Road will continue. On our side of the road, and I expect on the Castam side too, there is considerable wildlife. The woods and indeed my garden trees provide a home for at least 10 species of bat. Most garden birds can also be seen, and the pond in the council-owned woodland has moorhen and occasional kingfisher. Otter have also been spotted coming up the stream from the pond from the torridge, and woodland floor provides a home for hedgehog. If the new layout is adopted, 
I hope the disused section of the existing carriageway, as shown in the plan, will be planted, which in turn will reduce extra noise. I do not believe the Valley Road, in parts at least, is fit for purpose with increased traffic, being an old turnpike. Although there is a wide foot cycle, footpath cycleway after Water Park Road, further on Asda, BNM and Adams Court have all built in a way that limits the possibility of future road widening. Towards the town too, the road narrows with some ineffective traffic calming. There is or will be at least eight junctions between the Langton Village and Morton Park Road, where at Morton Park Road, I believe it is essential that a mini roundabout be constructed, not least because it is a bus route, number 75, that turns right at that point onto the Valley Road. And further visibility looking west towards its core, with this development traffic will increase. I have read the accompanying documentation and make the following comments that relate to my area using the numbering on the documents. The framework travel plan. The walk to town does have topo topographical changes, averaging about 80 metres at Castown to 5 metres on Bridgeford Quay. With Bridgeford built on a hill, the walk up is quite steep, and cycling with a sand bicycle upwards is for the fittest, thus, there is no road space for a cycleway until Mortal Park Road. There will also be a steep lift from the bottom at Buckingham Road to the Valley Road at present by a scratchy face lane. The nearby location of Lidl, Audi and Asda means that short top-up food trips can be undertaken by walking, but the shortest route past the tennis centre and that scratchy face lane will still be an uphill struggle for some. The weekend shop, however, will normally need a car. All three food shops are at the highest level, about 90 metres, and reaching them from the area near Buckingham Road, 50 to 60 metres, will be difficult for a standard bicycle. The widened footway between Water Park Road and Asda is a joint pedestrian cycle route, but all those signed is not separated with line markings on the ground. Low level trees discourage cyclists who often use the main Trevelli Road carriageway. The bus stop to the west of Farm Road is used mainly for alighting as the 75 bus ter terminates at Affinity, Atlantic Village. Historic environmental assessment, June 2020, Morton site. The house is no now owned by a family who are restoring it as a wedding and holiday venue. Reservoir. The site is owned by us and our neighbour. The reservoir tank was broken up in 1988. Before that, it served Morton House until direct mains were laid. The reservoir was served by a pipe from Buckland Road Reservoir across Castown. Water was then piped to Morton House. The stream from the pond was modified to supply water to livestock troughs at Winter Farm until direct mains were laid. The water course itself flows to the pill and eventually the torridge. The pipe across Castown may still be present. Well, the well shown on earlier plans in the hedge lines up with the ditch leads from the northern wooden side of Clavelli Road. Some maps mark issues at this spot. Most water is groundwater from rain through a pipe marked on the Sabbath water map laid, I believe, with road changes for the 1980s. But it's then an open stream from the footpath to the pond. In calm, dry weather, there's still a small flow and the water is crystal clear. I was informed there's a spring in the hedge at about 76 on the south side. This could be a small source of water that flows to the torridge. Recently, with the heavy rain, the well spring has been flowing on occasions across the road at this point. I have nothing further to add. Thank you, Christopher Young. Thank you, Sean. Um, next contribution is in support of it. Um, Jonathan Chick, if he's here, the agent. If you'd like to come forward and, and use that microphone at the table there, please. <clears throat> if you took that microphone up and speak right into the end of it, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. And once you settle, we've got three minutes to present to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Jonathan Chip from Walksine Planning, and I'm the agent representing Biddeford LBA LLP in respect to this application. We welcome that the application is recommended for approval. Fundamentally, this application is about the delivery of new employment, homes, and infrastructure, and also delivering the long term aims and objectives of your council. In particular, new employment in Bidford is a significant priority. This is not an opportunistic or speculative application, but one that has been brought forward carefully within a plan-led system. 
As you will be aware, the site falls within an allocation in the adopted local plan for employment and residential development. There are significant enabling costs associated with this development due to the quantum employment plans that are not associated with standalone residential developments. Whilst it has not been possible to achieve the exact balance of employment and residential land within the allocation, it has still been possible to include a substantial amount of employment land. Taking the overall quantum included in the allocation to 6.62 hectares. The residential element of the scheme is what will enable the employment land to come forward. Therefore, this is not a loss of employment land from the allocation, but a means to bring the employment land forward. Without this application, there would be no employment land coming forward or being made available. The employment land will make an important contribution to the economic needs of the area, including significant job creation for residents and surrounding communities. The additional homes provided will make significant contribution to the council's housing land supply, which is currently below five years. <coughs> the proposals also include new infrastructure and community benefits, including a new spine road, footpaths, drainage, public open space, 10% biodiversity net gain, and the full package of Section 106 obligations without compromising the viability. The application is a result of extensive pre-application consultation. We have worked closely with the Council's planning and economic development teams over the past three years, and there have been a number of revisions to the master plan to ensure delivery of as much employment land as possible. Following submission of the application, the applicant has worked closely with the Council to address any issues raised. And as a result, there are no objections from any statutory constituents. We note the concerns raised by the local objector, but these are all matters which have been addressed in the committee report and through the course of the application. We'd like to thank Torridge officers and other stakeholders for their efforts in getting our client sites to the position it is now. I'm grateful for your time and ask you to support today's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chip. Thank you. And finally to speak, uh, Councillor Brenton, board member uh, for this site. Councillor Brenton. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, fellow councillors. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As the uh, chairman indicated earlier on, uh, my time is limitless. Is that right? <laughs> Please, no, I'll try not to exploit that. Um, basically, my, my, as you know, the comprehensive report, which uh, the details of which I'm not going to go through, but I really just want to point out the housing element and the affordable housing element. That is a bit that the town council majored on. And I think it's one that we really should consider most seriously. Because how many meetings have we had when wringing our hands saying what we need in this area is affordable housing? And we're not getting it from this. I mean, I know there'll be nice figures presented to you about viability and how this can be afforded and that can be afforded. Come on, this is a big scheme. You're talking about a 50 million pound scheme here. And you're telling me that they can only come up after a bit of squeezing with 13 houses? That's just not all. You know, we're not stupid people. We know jolly well that these people do make big profits. And their directors get vast salaries. You know, that is the state of play we're in. And there's no problem selling houses in this area. They're going up in value all the time. So there's the, that doesn't come into the equation either. So I ask you to look at this report carefully. Well, I know you have. But, but in, in particular, for example, on page 17, the health and well-being element, which is um, from the county council, you know, saying how, how desperately urgent it is that we get uh, decent housing for our local population, many of whom will never, ever be able to afford a mortgage. We're, we're short of care staff now. My daughter's a nurse in the uh, local hospital, and, and they can't recruit people, nurses. Because they can't come down and afford the housing here. It's just so we're going to be stuck with uh, as in, uh, with um, a shortage of skilled people. You know, back in the day when I first actually moved from Bilbrook from across the water in, in North Devon, we used to have things like um, key worker housing. That hasn't been seen for decades. 
but we had it here because it, we needed it to get people into the area that were vital to our economy or our, our social infrastructure. So these, I think, are things you consider. And I think on that basis, you should really seriously consider turning this application down and handing it back to them and say, come on, come up with some realistic figures for affordable housing for our population. And I'll just make sure on that point, leave it there. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brent. <clears throat> right, that's the end of the contributions uh, to this application from the public and from Councillor Brennan. We would like to start the discussion on this application. Well, Councillor Lockham and Councillor Christian. Um, from my point of view, I think one of the most important um, parts of the report is on page 29 and 30 from the regeneration officer. Mm. I mean, he states he is disappointed with the loss of the potential in the plan, but then he further states, although a long way from a perfect scenario, now how many times in life, let alone in planning considerations, do we get perfect scenarios? <laughs> and he does go on to say, um, that this is a positive opportunity to bring forward much employment advertisements, so we should be supportive. So I entirely agree with that comment, and I think it, that is important. I completely take on board what Councillor Brendan has said about affordable, um, and it's only going to be 13. And I did chuckle to myself on page 24 when it says affordable housing, that it should be pepper potted around the estate. If they're going to be made in blocks. I don't quite know how 13 they're going to be pepper pot around the estate. Um, so I'll stop there for the time being. I've got one or two other matters, but regeneration is important, I think. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Christie. Thank you, yes. Um, well, my heart sank when I got the 247-page agenda. <laughs> um, just before Christmas, I have read every line of it, um, and with this application, the one thing that I have to point out, this is outline, and we need to get it right at this stage. Uh, to my mind, there are four issues. Uh, the loss of industrial land that uh, Councillor Locke has just referred to. Um, it was going to be 130 houses with eight hectares of employment land. It's now 211 houses with 6.62 hectares, I think is the new figure. Um, Mention has been made of our economic regeneration officer, uh, who I noticed opposed this to start with. And then I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it's pretty obvious from our report, it's pretty grudgingly uh, he supported it. Um, what intrigued me was the claims that somehow the tennis centre and the recycling made up the remnant of the employment land. And we've had the tennis centre come along. They employ virtually nobody because they keep telling us that it's all volunteers. They think, well, that's not really employment land, is it? And the recycling centre as well, I find, what, six people? Um, and I find it a bit odd that they're trying to somehow say that's you know, huge employment land. Um, as to the agent saying, well, won't go ahead. I noticed the profit margin in the plan for commercial land is 15%. You know, that's not bad uh, if you've had your latest interest, uh, what is it, 0.01%, uh, but 15% isn't bad. And the second issue that uh, Councillor Brenton has already touched on, affordable homes, 5% is derisory, um, especially when they do make a profit. 6% as against 17.5% on, on open market houses. And I noticed that even the district value did agree with the viability study and uh, did manage to up it slightly. Um, but I did go through the viability study, I'm intrigued by them, and I noticed yet again there's a million pounds for marketing. All you do is put them on the internet and they sell in two days, a million pounds for marketing. That's ridiculous. Um, also, on page 39, we're told that the viability study is based on the house sizes. And yet our planning officer was just told us that the planning sizes won't be decided until it's a full application. This is chicken and egg. The viability study is based on one set of figures, and that's the ones we've got before us. And yet I'm now told that, that what, those figures won't be correct. I think, well, how can we take the viability study at face value? 
Uh, the third point is uh, house sizes. Now, a quarter of the houses that are proposed are four bedrooms. I was intrigued when our planning officer said four and five bedrooms, because there are no five bedrooms, according to the developer. I'm not sure where that comes from, but a quarter of them are four bedrooms. And yet our own policy states only 15% should be four bedrooms. And yet, again, this go feeds into the viability study. And uh, the last point, and this is the elephant in the room. Nobody has mentioned it once. And yet it is the most vital issue, the school. School provision. Now, we are aware that, um, according to this, 1.3 million is being claimed by Devon County for education. 1.3 million. But where is the new school? We were told when Winsford, across the road behind Affinity Centre, whatever it's called now, uh, the developers there cannot build their 750 houses until they build the school because of the hugely pressing need for educational provision in Middlesex. We are then told that the developer of Winsford will not sign the section 106 for the school. So where is the school going to go? Because if you take this site and the one next door, which has already got outline, there are 485 houses being proposed. Those houses could be built with no school provided. And my mind goes back to Londonderry. When Londonderry was proposed, there was going to be a new school. Is there a new school? No. We are constantly upgraded by the public for not supplying infrastructure, whether it be doctor's surgeries, whatever. Schools, I read again in this, 1.3 million is going to a school, but there is no school. Where is it going to go? We cannot pass this when we haven't addressed that issue. And rather than Councillor Brenton saying, turn it down, I propose we defer it until we sort this out, because otherwise we leave ourselves open to a complete chaos in the education system in Bideford. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Christian. Sean, have you anything to comment on? Yeah, we'll come back on that. I don't know if any members want to speak first before I come back on <clears throat> items. Anybody else want? Councillor McGough. Thank you very much, Chair. I'd just like to second Councillor Christie. No point in reiterating what he's already said. I strongly agree with Councillor Christie, so I will second his proposal to defer this. Mm -hmm. Come back, we actually need some solid evidence. You know, the school issue is paramount to Bilford and an open area. So, you know, this slipping under the, under the carpet isn't good enough. So I fully endorse Councillor Christie. All right, just that um, our planning and manager comment. Thank you, members. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So just picking up on some of those uh, some of those matters. In terms of the housing mix and the viability, um, clearly we need to have a starting point for that viability assessment. If we were to do that viability assessment on a housing mix. Um, which included less number um, bed dwellings, then clearly that viability position would be worse than what's in this and would be achieving less numbers of housing. Um, you use the term chicken and egg, and I think you're quite right, because um, we do want to look at the housing mix at reserve matters, because that's the appropriate time to do so when you're looking at layout, et cetera. Um, but for the purposes of the viability, this is actually the best case scenario for us to look at those, um, that amount because if it was smaller dwellings, the profit is likely to be reduced. And again, the district value is here. We have a good comment further on that. In relation to this school, now, um, Councillor Christie mentioned 1.2, 1.3 million. That's not the amount for the school from this site. Um, that's a total, banging. that's a total financial package. Um, I think it was something, uh, 887,000 is the actual um, primary school amount. This allocation doesn't include an element for school. It never has done, so the school wouldn't be provided here. However, the school site is on the adjacent bid 09, which has for outline planning permission and is subject to reserve matters application at the moment, which will no doubt come in front of the committee in due course, which does show a school site, it would be a school. The officers have confidence that school will come forward. Um, we've been negotiating with Devon County Council and members will be aware of Dadden, for example, where schools going forward at Dadden now. Um, again, you could say chicken and egg because they do need that money for that school to come forward. 
but there is a site um, on the adjacent um, allocation, and that is where the school site was always allocated. It was never allocated on this site. Um, so I, I'm not clear how, or I'm not clear what the um, reason for deferring application would be on that, as this application site and the allocation never referred to school, but it does contribute that financial amount to the school on the adjacent site, which has outlined planning permission. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Perhaps you could just confirm, clarify for me, the rest of the committee and everybody watching and listening. I always understood that the site next to the Winsford site, there was going to be a school on there. But where are we with it actually being built? You know, it's all right, allocation of the site, and the Dadden, the Dadden Hill is one in case in point. We know there's a site going to be provided on there for a school. But how do we actually get the school built? If we, if we, you know, if the county, the county council have got the money, they don't bother to do. Yeah, clearly supplies of schools and delivery of school is a county council matter. Um, however, like I say, the first stage is to get planning permission for that site. Um, and adjacent site has got outline planning permission already. And reserve matters is with us, which does indicate a site for the school. Um, and that's the Bid 09 site, uh, Winsford, which is a different site, that's north of Clavelli Road. That also has um, provision for a school site. Um, I wouldn't want to speak for Devon County Council, but I imagine it'd be one or the other. And as it so happens, Bid 09, which is adjacent site to this, is the one that has already got outline plan permission, and there is a reserve matters application with us at the moment, which is valid, which officers are looking at. And like I say, we'll be coming to members in due course, which shows that school site. Thank you. Um, I'll bring Councillor Watson in there and then Councillor Christie. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, um, Sean, you told us that um, 106 there is 1.2 million. Does this include the education, money for education then? Is that, that's all in that, isn't it? Right, okay. And, and, if, and we talk about schools. Um, Devon County don't build schools. You know, I don't know whether they put an application in uh, for a school to be built, but they don't build schools, as told to us by John Hart, the leader of Devon County. They don't build schools. So I, I would like to have it carried to make it clear. Who, who is going to do this then and bring us and build a school, but on the allocated spot? And because I'm not sure where, when, if we'll ever get a school. I've never been to my I've been on this committee, I've never known Devon County build anything, but um, but yeah, I, I'm half, half thinking about going with Brinkford. Uh, thank you, Councillor Watson. Just to confirm with regard to the financial contributions mm -hmm. Section 106 will provide, um, there's clearly some confusion. Um, so, in terms of education, there'd be 98,140 in relation to um, special needs send provision yes. 887,838 in relation to the primary school yeah. uh, which we're discussing provision um, 81,669 in terms of land provision so that's acquisition costs 52,750 in terms of early years education 22,260 Depends in relation to the library service. 110,493 in relation to NH, the NHS requested, um, and it is detailed in the committee report. Um, Excuse me, Sean. Sure. How much money do we have to give to, uh, to highways then to, to do the roundabout? Um, Where's that money coming from? Yeah, Matt Collins may want to um, discuss that, but that would be delivered as part of this development. Um, right. We'll bring Matt into that in a second. What I would also like to say to members, um, discussion about the school, we need to determine this application on the basis of this application. Um, and this application is bringing forward the education contribution requested by Devon County Council, and it's meeting that, so it's meeting that infrastructure need. Um, there is no material reason for this application to deliver a school on this site. Um, it will contribute to a school, and that has been dealt with by that figure for the session one six obligation yeah. as requested. Um, so I have significant concerns. Um, 
asked to explore that further, but obviously that's for members to consider. Um, members may want to speak to Macklin about the de delivery of the roundabouts um, on that basis. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Sean. Uh, Councillor Christie. Yes, I just wanted to come back on the school because um, I'm a bit surprised to hear Dan Moore brought up. I mean, Dan Moore is miles from this site. And there's no way children are going to walk up to Dan Moore's up. Um, I'll go back to this one because when we passed the outline planning position for the site next door, the school site was provisional. It was only there on the basis that Winsford didn't come forward. And yet, I'm now told Winsford hasn't come forward, and yet there's going to be a school there. That doesn't sit well with me, because that's not, it's not absolutely correct, is it? It's not, nothing has been tied down, nothing has been signed off. It's all very well saying this site provides the money, but where does the money go? Um, I mean, if that school isn't built within what is it, five years, the section 106 go back to the developers. Uh, and yet we're not, we don't seem to be uh, fulfilling our duty of councillors of making sure everything is in place. Because as I said, the school is, to me is the big elephant in the room. It's the most important thing, really. Well, the, as the planning manager said, either the Winston site would have a school site provided, or bid, bid 09 and next door would have a, a school site. But not on this site that we're discussing this morning. There's no provision to have a site for school on here. But they are making this contribution towards a school of 887,000. And the roundabout in the district values assessment of the viability appraisal speaks of um, Sturton Company uh, allowed 345,000 for the roundabout, but the district value I see of 215,000 pounds. These all add up, there's certain company, they all add up to seven million. This is on page 72, but the district value adds it up to just under six million. Councillor McGough. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, I still support uh, Councillor Christie uh, for the deferral because the affordability is a bit of a to swallow, which I'm not going to be swallowing, to be honest. I think this, this council should stand firm on its 30%. And if that means the developers are going to go back and speak the figures, they're going to speak the figures. Uh, within this area, the affordable housing, we all know we're, we're, uh, we're pushing something uphill and not getting very good with it. Um, loss of commercial and industrial land. We need it. We need commercial and industrial land. That's how we get the growth within the area. We haven't got it. We're not supplying it. This development is not supplying the commercial and industrial use that we need. So we either build all commercial or industrial use. Or we just go residential. I don't think you can get the mix. It, it just doesn't go together because the mix of the residential with commercial, we all know there's going to be complaints from noise and things will be changing. Unfortunate situation with a, I think, fifth generation of dairy farm at the road here. It won't be long for that business is closed when once the development starts going through. You know, you're pushing out the employment, you know, the same about employment. I look to what employment is bringing to the area, it's bringing lovely employment for the developer. Use your own local trades coming through. So, I the deferral is going to be done in my view, Mr. Chairman, and it's the affordability side of things that I'd like to see improve. Because well, I, I'm not, I don't think, I don't agree with 13 footers. <clears throat> well, as far as um, the mix of business use and dwelling, you can do it if you do it properly. You can mix the two. And in fact, um, it's policy now throughout the country where you can to have housing near employment uses, but it's how it's done that matters. Um, I'll bring Councillor Craig in, I'll go to Councillor Lockdown. Councillor Craig. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'd just like to ask about the commercial industrial land. We know there's a shortage because we tried to you know, purchase land for our, our own environment centre. So if we lose some of the commercial and industrial land here, where on earth are we going to put it? Because we definitely need it, because truly we've assessed how much we need and that's how much we need. That's why it's in the plan. Where else is it gonna go? Well, it's not for discussion today, but over at the Winston site, there's a mixture there of residential and business use. So we're not completely devoid. This isn't the only area that we can have business development on. 
in the district. So there are other sites around, but we've got to stick with what we're looking at this morning. And the thing about deferring this application is really, we've got the evidence. We've had Stout and Company's uh, viability appraisal done, and then we've done it, we've had the district value go through it all. And I mean, I'm completely in agreement. I agree with Councillor Brent on the fact that we're not provided the amount of affordable that we would like to see. But we're between a rock and a hard place with a lot of these applications because these viability appraisals are done. Um, they're tweaked, they're adjusted. There's a lot of guesswork in, from, well, it is guesswork or supposition because as far as the, the housing provision, and I, Councillor Christie mentioned it, there are no five bedrooms planned by it, but 26%, I think it is, were down as four bedroom houses. So the viability has been worked out on that. Now, if that's changed and there are more four bed or there are five bed eventually at the reserve matters stage, that viability appraisal changes again, in my view. And I did make a note in here looking through all this that the section 106, which I don't think has been signed yet, has it? The section 106 list should include a viability review because whenever this is built, and we all hope it would be built as far as a residential element sooner rather than later, um, and house prices are going up all the time, tremendous amount over the last 12 months. There's talk of maybe an adjustment downward, but I certainly can't see it at the moment because it's such a shortage of housing. So we ought to have in the 106 definitely a viability review after a certain percentage of the houses have been built and marketed. Because over time, these houses could provide far more money, be far more profitable than is in the viability appraisal. And that is one of the big problems we've got with these viability appraisals. They are causing awful problems for us. But I don't think to defer it, there's no point in deferring it, uh, because we're not going to be any further forward if you defer this. We know there's no school site on here, so we can't defer it and decide we want a school site on here, because there's one proposed on the site next door or at Winsford. So it's no use to defer it to try and get any kind of clarity on provision of a school site. Because not, it's not part of the application. I'll bring Councillor Locke in there and then. Yeah, I complete, completely agree with the chair. I don't see how we can possibly defer it in terms of the school because a school site does not form part of the application. Mm. Um, and going back to Councillor McGough's um, lack of affordability, I too have great sympathy, but I cannot remember one application where we have got the 30% affordable. Every single plan and application seems to get around their viability assessments. Yeah. And I still can't understand, this is directed to Sean, why we couldn't have a condition now on the outside application that a viability review mechanism condition is set rather than wait to the section 106. Why can't it go on an outside application? Uh, such a condition wouldn't meet the test of condition, and the section 106 is the appropriate mechanism, which is totally enforceable. Um, so, yeah, as part the planning permission wouldn't be granted until section 106 was signed, and there would be an element in that section 106 requiring this review mechanism, um, which is something that we've started to do as members would be aware from previous applications. But the section 106 is the appropriate place for that review mechanism. It would still be totally enforceable. Just one more point, Chair. Um, I was pleased to see on page 34 a detailed response in the NHS. I don't think we used to see such detailed um, responses. And that there is a section 106 money, but we all know, I suppose, it's a bit like the schools that you can't make doctors build their new surgeries because they are private companies of business. So we can't say that we must build or enlarge your surgery. <laughs> um, so I've carefully considered this application. I have read through in great detail the full report and the viability report. And I note that there are no statutory consultees have any objections. So I will propose that the application is approved. 
Thank you, Councillor Locke. Councillor Christie, what do you think? Are you seconding Councillor Locke? Yes, I'm going to second it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. We, are, we do have a proposal currently to defer, but I'll uh, bring Councillor Christie back in. I will go back on schools, but just before that, I will follow up Councillor Locke's point there about the viability study. The easiest way around it is in our new district plan, we make the rule that the landowner who stands to make a huge amount of money will pay for a viability study before any land is included in our district plan. If it can't meet the 30%, it doesn't get included. Full stop. There's only one, I mean, I'm... I've sympathy with that. There's only one problem with that: the landowner would not know all the contributions that were going to be asked on that site when an application comes forward, like the education contribution, health contributions, highways contributions. A landowner wouldn't know at the initial stage how much is going to be asked in the future. So it'd be difficult to do a viability without knowing those those things. I mean, in here, it amazed me to see. Which I'm always very skeptical of is this biodiversity offset business. That seems to be being used an awful lot these days. There's 176,000 pounds here out of this site to go to biodiversity offset. We never do see what these schemes are. We give it to the North Devon Biosphere for their schemes dotted wherever they are. We never see it anymore. But that does not benefit the local area. So this biodiversity offset. Again, is another big cost, 176 million. For the development. But, yeah, Councillor Christie. Yeah, it's going to come back in the schools. Um, I was amazed the biodiversity as with you, because it's the last time I remember one of these. It was going to be in my ward, and it's the first I've heard of it. Uh, I don't know if Councillor yes. McGough remembers that. We were astonished. What? What's this all about? Anyway, um, going back to the schools, I'm sorry, but we're in a situation now where we were going to get a school at Lower Winsford. Apparently, they're not going to sign the section 106. I have no idea what's happening there. So there is going to be no school there at the moment. Our backup plan is the site next door. But that was only provisional. We've got nobody telling us, yes, there is going to be a school here. And on this site now, we've been told oh, they're going to give, I make it 1.18 million, rather than 1.3 now. But even so, where's that money going if there's no school? And I, I'm afraid I cannot sit here and just vote through another scheme that could see 211 houses built on this site with no school for the kids who live here. Because that could happen if we don't sort it out. That's why I want it deferred, so we can try and sort out the school issue. I don't understand why the one at Winter isn't going ahead, because we voted it through on that basis. Why isn't the developer going to build it, or at least provide the land? Uh, thank you, Councillor Christie, um, and I appreciate your, your passion on this uh, very important subject. Um, it does, however, stand to reason that this matter, this discussion, isn't necessarily directly related to the material planning considerations of this particular application. Um, in terms of the education authority leading on providing a school, um, there of course is an argument that we'd have to give them the tools for that financial ability to do that, and if we weren't to do that as part of this application, um, then a school may not come forward anyway. As you quite rightly said, there was two sites, Winsford uh, for Norfolk to Valley Road and this site. Um, originally, Winsford, I think, would probably be favoured as it was considered that to come forward first. Um, it hasn't, which is why you have a fullback site. And it appears that bid 09 is coming forward, um, hence the reserve matters application we're currently considering, gives us that confidence. The reason I mentioned Dadden earlier on wasn't in relation to potentially taking up the um, requirement for um, these new dwellings, but it's just an example of a new school coming forward. And we're in late uh, discussions as officers with Devon County um, about that school coming forward. And that's a good, do we have this very similar discussion about Dadden, the Dadden site came up about whether the school would be delivered? Well, that is going to be delivered. And I'd hope it'd be the same with the site on adjacent to the site, Bid 09. But that's not a material planning situation with this application. This application, Dev County Council have requested this amount of money and they have detailed within their consultation response, um, which was in the report, the increase of students um, or children required not just from this site, but also other sites around and the contribution required for that. And the place where that will be delivered will be bid 09 um, in the fullness of time, of course. And we are quite 
a long way along with granted planning permission for that site, um, subject to committee considerations, as it already has got outline permission, and we have got reserved matters. So to consider that element as part of this application, I find difficult. I think there is a separate discussion to have to be had. And I know we have had a meeting previously, um, committee members with Devon County Council of Education, and maybe that we want to rearrange a further meeting um, in light of the potential provision of data and bid online. But I don't see that as being particularly a consideration relevant with this application. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Christie. Yeah, sorry to labour this, but I I'm really happy to hear that discussions about a new school next door are pretty advanced. And therefore, I will maintain that we defer it until they're signed off. If they're fully advanced, it isn't going to be very long. <clears throat> Uh, I said the Gavin schools fully advanced, uh, fairly advanced um, in Northern. This site is advanced in terms of planning in that we've got reserved matters application, but not discussions in relation to the school. It's a Gavin site, just to clarify that matter. Right. <clears throat> um, as to some of the costs, when we look at the viability, and it was mentioned about the marketing costs. On page 73, you'll note there that the district valuer did consider some of these rates to be excessive. Um, Stoughton Company were looking for 3% of GDV in respect of market housing and 2% in respect of commercial element. The district value reduced, in his opinion, he considered the rates excessive. So, you know, it, it is assessed. The viability appraisal is properly assessed. It's national criteria that are used, and again, we we probably don't, in some respects, agree with it. Some of the national criteria that are used, but they are nationally accepted criteria that are used in these viabilities. As I mentioned a minute ago, and the one that we should be putting in the one on six is the viability reviews, because that's crucial. Uh, whenever the properties that aren't start to be sold, if they sell for 10 to 15, 20, 30,000 more than was thought during the viability project, which could be two or three years before, um, it would make a vast difference. So there is a chance to claw back. It's probably a very small chance, but there's a chance nonetheless. And, I, and as Sean has said, we have started to insert. I know the developers don't like this in the section one and sixes, but that's uh, that's a matter of hard lines as far as they're concerned. We want them in. I think we more and more will expect to see viability appraisals reviewed and signed up in a section 106. And as Sean said, they are then legally enforceable. And it does matter. And but we do have issues, I know. Now the first proposal, I think there's no more contributions. The first proposal was to defer. Councillor Christie proposed that. Councillor McGough second that. Do you still want us to vote on that? So we'll vote on that first, whether this is deferred. And I've got to say, we really haven't got any reason to defer it. But that was a proposal that's put forward by Councillor Christie and seconded by Councillor McGough. So could you take the vote on that? Thank please? you, Chair. Councillor Bowson. Against. Councillor Brown. Councillor Christie. Or. Councillor Craigie. Or. Councillor Lever. Against. Councillor Locke. Against. Councillor McGough. For. Councillor Watson. Against. Councillor Wiseman. Against. So that's three, four, and six against, Chair. Thank you. So that proposal to defer is lost. Now we go to the proposal from Councillor Locke to approve this scheme, seconded by Councillor Watson. You take the vote on Sorry, can I just confirm um, for my verbal update the amendment to condition seven? Um, so it should state bid 09 as opposed to bid 07. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. part yeah, of yeah. And also on the vote on this one to approve is in the section 106 agreement with this review mechanism and viability. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. could you take that vote? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor Bowson. For. Councillor Brown. Councillor Christie. Against. Councillor Craigie. Against. Councillor Leather. For. 
Councillor Locke. Or. Councillor McGough. Against. Councillor Watson. Or. Councillor Wiseman. Or. Six, four, and three against. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, you have a brief.
with the meeting. <coughs> Our next application is 7B, and that's on pages 97 to 198. And Tracy Blackmore, planning officer, will give this presentation. Thank you, Chair. I just want to check you can hear me. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is application reference number 1 slash 0926 slash 2020 slash BBTM. This is another major outline planning application with all matters reserved other than access. So this is for the erection of up to 290 dwellings, public open space, sustainable urban drainage systems, including attenuation ponds, and associated infrastructure at Lounge North Abbotsham Road in Biddeford. Next slide, please. So just a couple of verbal updates since the officer's report. There has been one further representation received since the publication of this report. Um, this goes into the matter of the ecology conditions, which are set out um, in the agenda, specifying the employment of an ecologist to ensure the delivery of the required ecological mitigation measures. So the representation goes on to say, whilst they welcome this in principle, it is incumbent upon the LPA to recognise they have an ongoing responsibility to safeguard the environment. Um, the LPA must, by continuing to use truly independent ecologists, um, notably the Council of Ecologists, to maintain careful scrutiny of all aspects of development likely to impinge on ecology. Um, so I think this has been addressed. Obviously, the ecology conditions set out. Um, the wording does include the appointment of an ecologist to manage the on site ecology works, and it is planned for independent ecologists to further review any sort of future reserve matters application. So I think, you know, just because we have used an independent ecologist to the outline, we would continue to do those works for the reserve matters to actually be in development on site. There is also one typo um, in regards to condition 5R. So that should be the identifying identification of design areas, general layout, built for densities and design principles. I think that condition actually makes you stable, um, which there is no stable on site. <laughs> um, so, okay, so going on to the presentation. So just before I sort of kick off, just to advise members, I have invited a number of technical consultees to today's plans committee. And I'd firstly like to thank them for firstly attending today and for all their work on this application. So the technical consultees present for members to ask questions of include Sarah Jennings, um, an ecologist who has reviewed the ecology aspect of this application. Helen Montgomery, a flood and coastal engineer from the Devon County Council, Mike Newcomb from the Highway Authority, and Pete McGuigan from the District Evaluation Officer. They are here and they are ready to answer any technical questions you have um, on the application. So please feel free to, to use those technical consultees. So moving on to the presentation. So this is obviously the location plan of the site outlined in red and blue. As a whole, the site is approximately 18.87 hectares in size and comprises of three agricultural fields and the southern half of the fourth agricultural field. Just to familiarise members with the boundaries of the site, members have uh, attended a comprehensive site, virtual site visit, and will be familiar with the site boundaries. Um, to the south of the site is Abbotsham Road, to the east is Osborne Lane, which is a very narrow country lane. And the site borders to the north, North Down Road. Um, and as I'm sure so, this, um, members can remember, there was video clips um, of, of me driving down those boundaries of the site. The site is bounded to the west by the A39 and the A39 viaduct. A single dwelling um, is located to the southeast corner of the site, which encompasses the whole site. Um, and the southwest corner of the site, there are a number of dwellings known as Lower Brinsford Court. So, the next slide. Sorry. This is another location plan with the south site outlined in red. It demonstrates the relationship of the site, which sits to the east of the built form of Biddeford, and again shows the road boundaries of the site and is on the plan. Next slide, please. This is a site context plan, which again demonstrates the site outlined in red. 
with Abbotsham Road indicated in blue to the southern boundary of the site, the A39 to the western boundary. And as you can see from the image, the site is located to the east of the bit of the built form. It might leave it lying immediately to the west of the London Grey Farm Estate, um, with Osborne Lane dividing those two sites. Next slide. So this is um, just in an aerial image. The site is outlined again in red. There is a central area of woodland called Badger's Hill Wood, which has a woodland TPO on it. And there are also watercourses running through the site, which run southwards into Kemmel Valley. Um, as you can see, there is also it is predominantly agricultural land with mature hedge boundaries and mature trees. The next slide. So just to provide members with a strategic context, this is an extract from the North Devon and Carriage Plan Policies Map for Bidford. The site is to the west of the town being indicated with an orange arrow. So this is to remind members how the site fits in with the context of the strategic centre of Biddeford. So the next slide is just slightly more focused in on the site on our the extract map. Again, the orange line represents our site and you'll see the black line, which is the development boundary for Biddeford, as you can see, um, the develop, it is outside the development boundary, but the development boundary joins um, the site to the south and the east. To the south of the site is um, bid one which is the strategic bit of the urban extension of approximately 71 hectares. So, just going sort of further into the presentation, I want to just remind members of the proposals. So, while the proposal has been submitted an outline, there has been an illustrative development plan um, framework, which has been submitted to demonstrate how the scheme could be accommodated on site. So this, this is sort of how, how it could be developed. It is illustrative, it, it, it is then used as part of, of um, determination for today. So as I said, this is a major planning application of all matters reserved, other than access, for up to 290 dwellings, including 15% affordable housing. There has been an offer of 11.07 hectares of informal and, and formal open space, including unique subspecies, including four attenuation basins. Access is for detailed consideration at this stage, and the proposal includes two vehicle accesses points from Abbotsham Road, indicated with the two red arrows. The hedge along the southern boundary is proposed to be translocated to provide a three metre shared footway cycleway along Abbotsham Road frontage and the widening of the footway on the northern side of Abbotsham Road between Osborne Lane um, and Lane Field to two metres to provide again connectivity in Spillerford. So I'm just going to run through some photos. Um, I know members attended a very detailed virtual site visit, so I'm going to try and be quite brief with the photos. Um, but I thought it was still important just to outline um, some of the photos of the site. The next slide. So this is a photo showing the street level of Abbotsham Road. Members will recall a video frontage of the boundary, which, which we travelled along, um, just to show that boundary and, and where the two vehicle access points are to be located on the site. And the proposal also includes um, the hedge to be translocated back into the site to provide that three metre footway and cycleway provision along Abbotsham Road to provide that connectivity into Biddeford. So next slide. So again, it has been agreed for Devon County Council that the existing 30 mile an hour zone on Abbotsham Road will be extended to the west. This will result in the 30 mile an hour zone being extended to include the whole frontage of the site along Abbotsham Road. The next slide. So this is a photo at the top of Abbotsham Road. As members will recall, the proposal includes the potential closure of Osborne Lane to be used for pedestrian and cyclists. Next slide. Um, so the proposal includes the widening of this section of footway to two metres to the existing crossing again to improve the connectivity and pedestrian linkages to the site to Bingford. So on to some photos from in the site. As I say, we did do a, virtual, a, a very comprehensive virtual video of the site. Um, members will remember this is the photo of the sun boundary of the site. So the hedge to the right of that photo is to be translocated to form the vehicle access. So next slide. So this is a photo slightly further back from the site looking at the southern boundary. Next slide. 
So this is a photo of the sort of more middle site. This is taken to the southwest of the boundary. So the white building in the distance is Lower Winsford Court, which a number of dwellings in the third party ownership. And the next slide just goes slightly focused in toward that boundary. Again, showing the dwellings in Lower Winsford Court, which is situated to the southwest boundary of the site. Um, the photo also includes an element of the western boundary of the site, that hedgerow, and behind that hedgerow lies the A39. So the next slide, so this photo is taking a look at the western boundary of the site, to the left is Badger Hill Wood, which will be further explored. Um, there are photos or trees within the photo, these to be removed to accommodate the road infrastructure network into the site. So this photo is taken from the eastern boundary, the white dwelling of the Lower Winsford Cottage, which is located with its own access from Osborne Lane. The next slide shows the eastern boundary of the site and the hedge bank is the Osborne Lane. And as you can see, the eastern residential edge of Biddleford with existing dwellings in that London Drew estate. Another face of the eastern boundary. And then my next slide shows where I am in sort of the northern boundary, looking to the southwest of the site, again showing that built form of Biddleford. Um, so the next slide looks west of the site and looks at the A39 viaduct in the background. The next slide is the northern boundary of the site again, and again the photo shows one of the water forces running through the site. The next slide shows photos looking south to Badger's Hill Wood, which is located to the centre of the site. And this photo is within Badger's Hill Wood, um, which is 0.45 hectares of woodland. Um, so during the course of the application, the majority of the woodland um, has been agreed to be accessible by public access, um, but this is to be managed. There is a proposed buffer area around the woodland for protection, which will be shown later on in this presentation. As members will recall, an independent ecologist, Sarah James, who is here today, has recalled review the ecology matters in respect of this application. So another photo, next slide of the woodland into the north, and another photo again of the woodland. So the next slide shows the western section. And this is another one of the, the western section of the site. So this shows, I think, the sort of undulating and, and sort of steeply sliding topography of the site. And there is quite a varied topography of the site. It also clearly shows the London Jury Estate. So the next slide shows the northwest corner of the site. And to the left, you can see the western boundary of the A39 and the A39 viaduct. Another photo, again, showing the western section, showing that existing built form, and you'll just see the woodland in the middle of the, of the site. And then another photo, again, um, showing the western section and the western parcels of land to be developed. Another photo, again, looking west, um, showing the southern element of the Badger's Hill Wood. And this is another taken. Next slide, sorry, is another photo and that just shows the southern boundary, the Abbotsham Road, where we started in terms of that hedge bank is to be translocated and needed for the, the two outcomes at the point. So, a landscape visual impact assessment and LBIA have been submitted, um, which shows photo montages. So, the next slide shows various viewpoints surrounding the site. So the next few photos will show photo montages from the existing built form of Biddleford, so taken from the London Drew Estate to the east. So the viewpoints are 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27. I don't know if you can see them very well. The yellow dots where the London Drew Estate are. That's where these next slides um, have been taken from. So the next slide shows the top photo taken from Melbourne Way, which indicates the site with a black arrow. And the bottom photo demonstrates the site from the open space to the east of Sandbridge Park. The next slide shows the top photo from the open space to the south of the Warren View, and that is the glimpse of the A39 viaduct. And the bottom photo is from the open space north of Quarry Close. The next photo is from the green space in London Jury Estate, and um, there are a number of viewpoints. So you can see the site 
Pleasures Hill Wood, the A39, um, and um, the next slide is again the top um, photo is the open space, the West Lane Enfield, which is, you know, the site isn't that visual from that viewpoint, and then the bottom photo is the site from Abertry Road. So the next series of photos shows the LVIA images from the north and west of the site. So the next slide shows a viewpoint from the site, from within the grounds of Kenwood Castle. So looking to the northwest. The next slide shows the photo from the east towards the site, from the viaduct of White House Cross. The next photo shows uh, looking southwest of the site from the lane east of the A39 viaduct. And the next view is the um, view of the site from the east of the site from the edge of Abertion. And the next slide, so um, I think this is quite a good slide. So this is standing from the north of the site from the public footpath on Purse Hill, looking towards the site. In terms of the submitted LVIA, submitted in support of the application, members will recall from my report, this has been reviewed by an independent landscape officer. The comments of the independent landscape officer are set out in full um, in your report, and I'm sure you have read those. The conclusion comments of the independent landscape officer um, concludes that there is some disagreement with the main conclusion of the submitted LVIA, and then the landscapers officer's view the proposal would result in a change to the landscape character of the site. This will be further explored um, in my presentation. So the next slide um, is a plan of the surrounding landscape designations. And sorry, this is a bit small to see. So the site is annotated in red in the middle. The site is not itself covered by any statutory or non-statutory designations for landscape or, or quality or character. So the North Devon A, O and B is approximately 800 metres to the east. Um, and there's an orange hatch line to the east. Um, and also the A, O and B longs along the west of the site, which again is that orange hatch line. There are 17 listed buildings within a study area, which will have been indicated on the plan as the blue circles. The council's conservation officer has been consulted on this application and has raised no objections. The County Council Senior Historic Environment Officer has also been consulted and advised that there has been previously archaeological field evaluation that has demonstrated the presence of some archaeological features across the site. These features, however, are not such significant that they should be preserved in situ. The impact of the development, however, should be mitigated by a programme of archaeological works. Therefore, a pre-commencement condition has been agreed to ensure that archaeological I'll say that word, works are agreed and implemented before the commencement of the works, which the applicant has agreed to. So just going on to the stop back to the site, and also some technical highway drawings. So next slide. So as we know, um, highways is a detailed consideration stage at outline. And um, Mike Newcomb is here for if you have any highway questions. So this is again a technical highway drawing showing the two new vehicle access points from Abertron Road and the three metre verge shared footway cycleway to allow the connectivity to Billiford. So the next slide again picked up um, by our virtual site visit shows the widening of the footway along the northern side of Abertron Road um, and laying the field the two metres to the existing crossing again to provide that better connectivity. I just thought at this point, and I'm sorry, it is quite a long presentation, but it is quite a complex site. I would just like to go back to the framework just to remind members again how the site could potentially be developed. So next slide. So the beige areas are where the site um, is being proposed for dwellings, and the proposed site features are marked on as attenuation ponds, and the green areas are proposed formal and informal open space. And the black dash um, lines of the indicative road structure into the site. So, Badgers Hill Wood, as the next slide, is obviously an important um, in issue in terms of this application. Um, to the centre of the site, um, which is designated as an other site of wildlife interest. 
The woodland is approximately 0.45 hectares of woodland and categorised as retained in moderate condition. The woodland is retained to be retained as part of this proposal. During the course of the application, the ancient woodland specialist from Devon Biodiversity Records um, has surveyed the woodland and confirms that part of the woodland, shown as um, section two on that plan, should be treated as provisionally ancient woodland. As I said, the proposal would not result in the direct loss of the woodland. However, without mitigation, there, there would be impacts. Um, it is proposed that the woodland management plan is to be adopted as part of the scheme and will form part of the landscape and ecological management plan to be submitted and approved as part of the reserve matters application. So next slide, so as again, there is a tree preservation order which applies to the trees present within woodland, the Baddersville Woodland site. So that area is in a green hatched area to the left, and that is the actual original on the right tree preservation order showing um, the full extent of that TPO on that woodland. And so the next slide, so an agricultural assessment has been submitted, which concludes the only tree cover to be removed will be a small number of trees um, identified as G6, located between the Lower Winsford Cottage to allow the construction of the linking road access. Additionally, the southern hedgerow bank is to be translocated northwards to allow the widening of the carriageway <coughs> and the footpath. And a number of existing trees positioned within or adjacent to the hedge tank are to be removed through the widening process. None of the trees within the tree preservation order are to be affected by the proposals. So, just going on to the next slide. Again, this is outlined, but there is an indicative framework indicating the potential of approximately 11.07 hectares of on-site green infrastructure incorporating unique natural green space and meaningful space. Again, this is only um, it, it is only outlined, it is only initiative, but it's what could be provided in terms of that green infrastructure. So just going on to a drainage plan. So the majority of the site falls within flood zone one, which there's low probability of flooding. However, the Kenwood stream watercourses run south to north through to the middle of the site, which has an associated area of risk of flooding, which is designated by say two, three. The submitted, um, submitted bid risk assessment confirms a sequential approach will be taken to lay out. The area of development is all within flood zone one for any potential dwellings to be erected on the site. Um, and the majority of the watercourses and associated flood zones are within Badgersfield Wood. Which is not to be developed from. So, on to the next slide. Um, as I said, there are two watercourses run through the site through Badgers Hill Wood, watercourse one, um, entered into the culvert as the South Fabrican Road. Again, um, the next slide shows the sub drainage scheme is proposed to manage the surface. Sorry, next slide. So, a sub drainage scheme is proposed to manage the surface water drainage well, um, comprising of um, detention basin serving the catchments within the site. As I said, the technical officer is present at this meeting, as there are a number of representations regarding surface water and existing surface water flooding problems within the locality. In terms of foul drainage, next slide. The foul drainage is to be disposed of by the existing public sewer, so Southwest Water have raised no objections. To this and confirms any improvements considered necessary will be undertaken by them to ensure development can be adequately drained. The last slide just shows an illustrative month plan to demonstrate how the site could be, could be accommodated for up to 290 dwellings. So, just going on to the planning considerations, which are all detailed in your report, just as a summary in terms of the principle of development. As you're aware, the council, as a council, we are not able to demonstrate by the housing land supply. So the determination must be based on the tilted balance, which is a presumption in favour of sustainable development unless a harm attached to the proposal would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits which assess against the policies in the framework as a whole. Um, so just going on to landscape character and visual impacts, 
The site is not covered by any statutory or non statutory landscape character or quality designation. As members will have seen, the site has a varied topography and is very steeply sloping in places and undulating in others. The site is well covered by mature hedgerow and tree belts within the existing road lanes forming defendable boundaries. An LVIA was submitted in support of the application. The LVIA has been independently reviewed by the independent landscape officer and her conclusions are set out clearly in the report. In summary, summary she considers there would be moderate to substantial landscape change and she does disagree to some extent with the conclusions of the LVIA and confirms there will be some residual landscape and vision harm. <coughs> it is identified that the proposal will result in landscape change. As such, I think it is important for members to um, be clear that there, there is some conflict of policy objectives, particularly ST14 and DMO8A, which seeks to conserve and enhance the local distinctiveness and landscape policy. Of course, it is noticed that parts of the site can be seen within a context of Biddeford and that existing built form, and a reserve gas application would be able to secure mitigation measures. So going on to heritage and archaeology, there are no designated heritage aspects within the site boundary. There are a number of listed buildings and scheduled monuments within the study area. The Council's Conservation Officer has no objections to this application. Equally, the County Council Senior Historic Officer has advised that the archaeological features on the site are not significant that they should be preserved in situ. A pre-commencement condition is recommended for a written scheme of investigation and has been conditioned as part of this recommendation. So residential immunity, as this is an outline, it is not considered the proposed development result in harmful impacts on residential amenities or neighbouring or future occupiers, providing con conditions recommended by the Council's Environmental Protection Office that are included in any planning decision. Highways, the proposed development includes access for detailed consideration at this stage. Um, as set out, it includes two vehicle access points from Abbotsham Road, each featuring a right-hand turn lane. A three metre shared footway cycleway is proposed along Abbotsham Road, to provide that connectivity to Bidford. Flood, risk and drainage. Again, this collection approach will be taken to, to ensure that only areas from flood zone one will be built upon. Members have seen the proposal for the surface water drainage strategy. The concerns raised by third parties are noticed in regards to flooding and surface water drainage issues. However, the technical quantities are advising the LPA the proposal provisions for drainage to the site are technically acceptable and recommend conditions to attach to any recommendation. Ecology and biodiversity, the ecology aspect of this site has been looked at in huge detail. There are a number of ecology reports conducted in 2016, 2017 and 2020 which provide a robust evidence base for assessing the impact of the proposed development on important features identified on the application site and beyond. An independent ecologist has reviewed these studies and has requested further ecological information. She has concluded, providing the proposed mitigation measures are secured for appropriately worded conditions, the proposals will meet the local national policy and ecological legislation. The biodiversity gain is only indicative, but this is only an outline application. However, a, how, a biodiversity net gain being proposed is greater than 10%. This is partly due to the extensive green space and mitigation enhancement measures proposed for Badger's Hill Wood. Viability and Section 106 obligations, and the application has been supported by a viability appraisal, and this has been externally reviewed by the District Foundation Office, who has the outcome of this exercise as appended to your committee report, which I'm sure you have all read. The conclusion of the district valuer is that the scheme is not financially viable when contributing to planning commission requirements, including 30% affordable housing. There has been some compromise with the applicant, and the applicant has agreed to provide 15% affordable housing on the site, which equates to 44 affordable units, with the required section 106 contribution required. Again, um, the district value has instructed a viability review to be agreed, and that has been agreed by the by the applicant in terms of 
um, re, re looking at that viability and, and reviewing that um, if the application was um, to proceed. So the planning balance and conclusion. As discussed, the IPA or the council cannot currently demonstrate five years land supply of housing land to meet the identified needs of the district. It is then necessary to consider the adverse impact of the proposal if that would significantly and demonstrably outweigh benefits, which members are aware of for the tilted balance. In this instance, the proposal would provide a significant contribution to up to, up to 290 dwellings towards local housing supply on a site which borders the strategic centre of Billiford. It should be noted that the proposal has a range of benefits, including provision of on-site green space, um, as well as a number of financial contributions towards health facilities, education provision, and highway improvements. Turning to the adverse impacts, as discussed earlier, the proposed development has been considered to change the character of the site and the impact of the development would have some adverse landscape impact. However, it is recognised that mitigation measures exist, which could reduce that impact upon time, but do not negate them entirely. Due to viability issues, the application is unable to make a policy compliant level of planning obligation. The district value has confirmed, and the local planning authority ha has um, agreed that the 15% affordable housing across the site, um, with 40, 40 units, 44 units um, being secured. So I think this is an up along balanced decision um, where the benefits and harm have been addressed. Um, it is your office's consideration that the benefits on the whole outweigh the harm when it gets to the policies and the local plan and MPF here. Therefore, there is a recommendation of approval, uh, which was made with the imposition of all planning conditions and the section 106 obligations. So I'm very sorry for that very long presentation. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive presentation. Uh, our first speaker speaking against this is Mr. Brian Sims. Speaking against the application. I think he wants to stand up yeah, to give no. his presentation. Yeah, which I'm, as you can all hear over there. Which I'm happy for him to do yeah. as long as he does project his voice. So I'll like try and project the voice. Um, and you have three minutes, Mr. Sims. Three minutes. To address the yeah. the uh, I'll tell you when the three minutes start. Yeah, because I'd like to say good morning to you all. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of Philip Marlowe. He's away on a holiday book nine months ago. So any questions, I'm afraid I'm reading his script. Right, 35 years ago, the Kenworth Valley was identified as a vital green corridor between the river and the sea, thus separating Biddeford and Northern, and a major effort has gone into improving the natural environment within the valley, and it is now an important ecosystem. The applicant claims biodiversity gain on their site, but this is based on flawed assumptions and treats the site as, an inde as independent of the rest of the valley. Any ecosystem is like an elaborate carpet. If you cut it up into little fragments, all you're left with is scraps of useless material. The developer claims that unimproved glass sand has little value. However, on the same area on the other side of the valley exhibits great biodiversity. Recent surveys have shown over 40 different fungi, some 80 or more bird species, 125 spiders, including some rare ones, and over 200 plant species. And it is a vital part of the mix which is required to maintain the whole Kenworth Valley ecosystem. The mitigation measures included in the model are not evidence based and have little proven record of success, especially for bats and badgers. The assumptions around hedgerows and trees are based on leafy Warwickshire in central England and not a North Devon Valley where salt laden winds blow in from the sea. One only has to look at the long time it takes for trees to get established. And I've got a note here that Tracy's got some pictures of, of these. Um, there we are, that's eight years old. 
the tree that should be double that height. You can see the length of time it's taken to get established. And there's several more. You can look at them when I'm talking to you. I should have run out of in three minutes. The developers have not bothered to visit the reserve and ask about the extensive range of fauna and flora records, all the expertise built up over 35 years. Could it be that had they done so, then they would have found that their application was doomed to failure on purely environmental grounds. The biodiversity gain results that they have predicted are given with specious accuracy and no sensitivity analysis is offered. If their assumptions relying on a theory as opposed to factual <coughs> evidence prove incorrect, as they will be, there will be a major biodiversity hit and it'll be too late to do anything about it. The pandemic has also shown the value of open landscape, green space, and fresh air to us all. The valley has been a vital walking route and therapy for many people from Ford Bridge onwards, and it is a green Devon Coombe within walking distance of the town. There are no buildings in view that do not appear on the 1842 tide map. So this development would destroy the ambience. In conclusion, all the grounds for rejecting the proposal three years ago, especially wildlife and landscape, are even more valid today, especially if one is concerned not only for the environment, but the mental and physical health of the local population. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sims. <clears throat> that was within the three minutes. Thank you very much. Can I just point a point? Yes. Yeah. Right, <clears throat> the next contribution at uh, speaking against is a letter that Sean will read out, our planning manager will read out from Christina Brace. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Can members hear me? No. no. Better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, a statement from uh, Christina Bracey. With reference to receipt of your email dated 23rd December 2021, respectively above application, we would request that you read our objections as stated in our email to you of 10th of November. Also, we would like you to take the following statement into account. Building in the immediate Biddeford area has been prolific during the past 10 to 15 years. Whilst everyone appreciates the need for housing, it is very often not aimed at those in need of social housing. Instead, we more often than not find that an X number of houses could be built within, with a minuscule percentage given to social housing. This, as far as we can see, is a current proposal for the intended application above. Over the years, we have seen a sad decline in the town of Biddeford. It has become to many a poorly neglected and forlorn township. Shops lie empty with unkem unkempt exteriors, which in turn leads to a lack of pride and appreciation by the town's people. We feel that, whilst tourism is an important part of our town, those who visit the town are greatly disappointed when seeing our high street, often the most important and sought after area when holidaymakers arrive. We have an out of town retail outlet, but this has only served to take away a lot of trade from Billyford Town itself, where revenue is much needed. To build more houses without good infrastructure is surely putting the, the cart before the horse. We no longer have a working hospital and the minor injuries unit has been closed for the last 18 months and is likely to remain so, thus leaving anyone with an emergency to have to travel almost half an hour journey to Barnstable, North End District Hospital. This is a major concern for most of the town's residents, be they young or old. The journey can still mean a difference between life and death. Unemployment in the area is high and we have no real prospect of that changing anytime soon. To build yet more houses between London Dairy Farm and Abertion Village is not justified. It's pure greed on behalf of developers who, while starting how wonderful and balanced everything will be, in reality, as has been seen in the past, this will not necessarily be the case. How many times has the Housing Planning Commission been granted on the proviso that so many of the new dwellings will be given social housing, which at a later stage has often been withdrawn or altered under the guise of cost effectiveness? Residents of London Dairy Farm and Grimble Place do not need yet another huge development being undertaken in such close proximity. 
there would be massive inconvenience to both pedestrian and motorists alike, not to mention, very importantly, the devastation this would cause to our wildlife. Thank you for reading this. We hope it will give food for thought on this very contentious issue. Yours faithfully, Christina and Jeff Bracey. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> and then we have speaking in support is the applicant, Stuart Carvel, please. If you'd like to come up. <coughs> And um, you have three minutes to address the committee, thank you. You speak straight into the end of the Mr. Chairman, can I just ask, is he the agent for the applicant? Because his name's not on the support, sheer carbon support applicant, it says. Yeah. Do you want to clarify? So I work for Glavin Development, so the applicant is um, Glavin Development Limited, and this is Jay Turner. Um, so, firstly, thank you very much to the chair, uh, to the chair, and thank you for the officers of her recommendation and her very comprehensive presentation. Um, this recommendation follows proactive discussions between the applicant, officers of the council, and statutory consultees to ensure that all matters have been carefully considered and addressed on and off site, both pre and post application. The application will provide a range of house types and a density that will ensure smaller properties provided, including 44 units of affordable housing. The proposal is in keeping with the existing current <coughs> patterns of Hilford. And the development has responded to the matters raised by the landscape officer. As with any site, including allocated sites, there is always going to be a change from undeveloped nature to that of built form. As considered by the officer report, the uh, proposed development will change the character of the site and there will be some limited landscape impacts. These are mitigated through new hedgerow, new hedgerow and tree plant. This is a green infrastructure and public open space for development with over 11 hectares provided on site, to which there is currently no public access. Management will be provided for protected species and trees and hedgerows on site, including badly sealed wood. Um, regarding transport and travel, the site proposes the conversion of Osborne Lane to a walking site for the group, as well as shared provision on the site front and jump throughout the site. Section 106 contributions will also be provided to the Kenwood Valley Cycle Route and the A39 Junction Safety Improvements. The application proposes the extension of the 30 mile an hour limit along Appleton Road and um, reducing speeds as the vehicles come into Bittersweet, along with built frontage. Um, all these measures, along with the travel plan, will help and encourage movement by sustainable modes. In relation to drainage, the site will be able to effectively manage water runoff, controlling its discharge, and upgrading existing culvert within the site, which will help address the issues that have been raised about off-site flooding issues. Um, there's also significant contributions to the Section 106 to libraries, new education facilities, a new community hall, um, contribution to a north and swimming pool, and a 3G artificial plan for community. The council, cannot, the council cannot currently demonstrate a fiber supply as such as immediate, immediate needs grant units and to which this site will be able to contribute significantly. Biddeford is expected in the development plan to deliver over 4,000 dwellings in the plan period. Biddeford is the strategic centre identified in the policies and as such the officer report confirms the site is consistent with the spatial strategy of the local plan. As such there is need to grant units of Biddeford to meet this requirement which your officers have carefully considered as addressed sustainably through the delivery of the site. Granting a planning permission brings about a number of benefits for Biddeford and the wider district in accordance with the development plan. As such, I respect, respectfully ask you to follow your officer's recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carvel. Thank you. Right, that concludes the contributions from the public to this application. Um, Chairman, so, Major, I am dual hatted on this one. Right, Councillor Christie is dual hatted on this one. Thank you. To me, the final, the final decision we've got is on the balance that we've got to look at between the benefits of this scheme. Uh, and of not having this five year housing land supply and the disbenefits of it, the loss of this ancient woodland site. Now, I'll let somebody set the ball rolling, but personally, I've got some grave problems with this, with approving this. But I'll leave it at that for now. Councillor Christie. Thank you. Um, well, I've got six issues with this one. Um, the first one is not in the local plan area. Uh, in fact, I remember this one, it came forward almost in the last week 
I think, before we signed off the local plan. But very, very late. In, and you'll notice in our, on our plan today, it does say withdrawn. Uh, in, I think it's October 2018, and we, we signed off at the beginning of December. Um, it's gone up since then from 260 to 290 houses. Uh, the second point is both local councils who involve both Babisham and Biddeford are very strongly against it. Um, I did look at the public consultation actually, because I was intrigued, um, because there are many, many objectors on our website. Uh, when they did the public consultation, there were only nine people replied. Uh, I'd love to have read the letters, but they're all totally redacted, uh, so you can't actually read. And even the developer agrees that they weren't all wholly in favour. I don't know what it means because you can't see them. Uh, the third point is um, the site in relation to Biddeford, because it was interesting to see the photographs, what it looks like from London area, what it looks like from inside the field. Of course, the major impact is from the link road, where I have to say at the moment, if you drive along the link road, London Dairy sticks out like a huge intrusion into the countryside. All the trees have lost their leaves. It really does um, stick out enormously. And um, this will only accentuate it, It'll be right up to the link road. Uh, we heard from our planning officer about the, um, the problems with the um, landscape, the Devon County officer. I'll just read out what he said actually, or she, I'm not sure if it, who it is, but I remain in disagreement with the main conclusion of the landscape valuation that development can be accommodated at the site without causing material harm to the adjoining countryside or townscape. In my opinion, there will be residual landscape and visual harm, that's in heavy type, as described above be weighed against the benefits of the scheme. So clearly there are problems there. Um, Torridge's comments were fascinating because on page 127, they talk about this. Uh, it says, a development of up to 200 dwellings will be in accordance with the local plan, a hierarchical approach to locate development within the district's most major settlement, within Biddeford. This is stuck on the edge. I've used the analogy before that Biddeford begins to resemble a tube of toothpaste. It's being squeezed out and it's going right east-west. There's no development north-south. And uh, this, I think, will really accentuate that. Um, my fourth point, the environmental impacts. Now, firstly, flooding. Now, this area is in a critical drainage area. We know that because we've told that. Uh, water from the site enters the Kenworth Valley. Uh, and apparently it's all going to be dealt with with suds. Now, I've said before, I don't trust suds. But we all know we had a problem at Morton where the suds failed and the garages were flooded. The MP got involved. It was a huge disaster. Um, now, the Environment Agency were going to raise the height of the Kenworth Valley Dam. They've walked away from that now. And yet, here at Torridge, we're faced with development completely around the Kenworth Valley. Stretching from Rose Hill, 250 houses, Davon, um, this estate, Winsford, Morton, Londonderry itself. The whole valley is going to be surrounded by um, development. And we all know, you know there's going to be a lot of water flying off that land. Can the suds handle it? I don't think they can. Uh, the area floods very badly already. If any of you have ever been down there during the flood, you'll know it's completely impassable. Um, the African Actually, in one very interesting statement, it's on page 102, if you want to see it, they agree that the underlying soil has very low infiltration rates. When I read that, I thought, well, that's not going to help studs, is it? Uh, again, another environment for the fact after the floods, the woods. Now, it's a very unusual woodland. It's, I have been to it. I went to it a long time ago. Um, it's a very strange place, actually. It has a real atmosphere of it. If you read the, um, the statements that come out, uh, the ancient woodland specialist from Devon Biodiversity Record Centre has surveyed the woodland, state that part of the woodland should be treated provisionally as ancient woodland. We don't have much of that in North Devon, I have to say. Um, the idea that access to the woodland is going to be allowed both north, south and east, west, a pathway going through it, um, basically, it means any amelioration that's put forward for this site 
uh, is laughable. I mean, if you go to Londonderry next door, where there's a similar site, actually, it's a ravine uh, that was left. I'm afraid I've been sent pictures, and if you go there, you all know about it. Uh, some of the surrounding houses use it as a rubbish dump. And they're not even allowed into that site. There is, it is fenced off. This one isn't going to be allowed. You think, how long is that woodland going to last? Um, on page 146, there's talk of a biodiversity gain. I go back to what Councillor Le Leather said earlier. I think this one, in this case, is totally spurious. You've got a bit of ancient woodland, you're going to build a state round and allow everyone to go. In. I'm not, you know, you know what the kids will do, you know what will happen to them. The third point about the environment, nearby sites. And when I read the report on page 129, it says the AOMB uh, is 800 metres away. Well, the Kenworth Valley Nature Reserve, which I got set up quite a few years ago, that's 700 metres away. This is our own figures, by the way, from page 141. Uh, the uh, Godborough Castle County Wildlife Site is 130 metres away. And the Cornborough Bird Reserve is less than 100 metres away. <coughs> now, I know that reserve because I actually planted trees there many years ago. Um, and yet it's taken as, oh, no, there's no problem. And I think, no, that can't be right. Again, the fifth point, and I'm sorry to label this, schools. Uh, 1.3 million, and I have checked the figures, Sean, it is 1.3 million on this site. Uh, it's been requested by Devon County. And again, where are the schools going to go? You know, what are we doing? Again, uh, I have to point out that London Dairy is 300 houses. It was going to have a school, never got built. Uh, Morton Park, the most recent development up there, is 200 houses. This site is going to add another 290. That's 790 houses without any new schools. And yet I'll probably be told, oh, they're going to give some money towards them county, so that'll be all right. And the last point, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear, um, the viability study. Uh, this was an interesting one because the developer offered 10% affordable. And even the district value had disagreed quite strongly with us. It's gone up to 15%. Uh, but what I can't understand, and the reason I asked the agent who he represents, is that uh, the applicant is Gladman's, but it's also the owner of the field. And yet, in the viability study, uh, land values, they vary, because the district values disagree, between 4.6 million and 3.8 million. And you think, well, wait, wait a minute, how can the owner of the land quote this is a figure when they already own it. And yet this is set against the viability study. And I can't follow that. Uh, on page 174, uh, there's a fascinating one I've never seen before. The district value has struck it out, but I will just highlight it because I found it really intriguing. Um, the developer in their viability study, they quoted 1.3 million for future home standard. Well, that's not actually legally enforceable yet. And yet they've come to the intent by ability. So the district value has picked it up as well and it's crossed it out. And I thought that's fascinating. You know, if Elon Musk has his way, we'll all have rocket pads next to our houses. Perhaps we should start quoting for that. You know, you think, wait a minute, you can't quote for future stuff that isn't. Uh, how do you do that? Um, the other one, and uh, this is a small one, but page 148, it quotes £300,000 to improve the A39 junction for the Buckley Road. This is that mill development. You're thinking, wait a minute, this development here has nothing to do with Buckley Road. How come Devon County yet again uh, raising money? And I would have thought Dad Moore was that they've got enough houses there to pay for that on their own. The other one is, and I'm very sad to say this, there's 300,000 pounds to the Kenworth Valley Cycleway, which I've been going on about for years. However, when I sit on active travel and the LC WIP groups, we know that the landowners point, uh, stated point blank they're not going to sell the land to us. So £300,000 in there probably won't go anywhere. And I'm just wondering where that would go and whether we could start putting this money at £600,000 there on road improvements. Should it go towards more affordable homes? But as it stands, I think there are so many points against this scheme that I'm going to vote against it. Thank you, Councillor Christie. <clears throat> Anybody else? Councillor Locke? I cannot 
possibly follow what uh, Councillor Christie said very eloquent and picked up several of the points that I was going to pick up. I was always open to ask about DTC highways and the Kenwood cycle routes. I was going to ask how that split, how that money was going to be split, 610,000. And as Captain Christie said, um, if local land, lo, landowners won't give their permission, then the cycle way won't happen. And that's happened on various parts of the Tarka Trail as well. So I also had that query. Um, going on to the TV report, I also studied what the heading, what come under the heading at normal costs. And I also picked up about the £4,500 for each of the 290 dwellings. Um, and I wondered where that was going to go. And then there was £60,644 for just two bus stops. So I picked up on that. Um, Ecology report I thought was very good and I read it and I downloaded it and I've read it so I do agree with the ecology report. Um, if you turn now to page 100, full paragraph down, I'm saying this tongue in cheek because I might be misreading it. The third paragraph down with Abbotsham Parish Council's report. It says there were complaints about traffic congestion on the narrow bridge of Abbotsham Road as far back as 1894. Yeah, traffic congestion. Did you <laughs> that be 1984? Well, I'm sure they weren't doing traffic surveys in 1894. Too many horses and cars. Too many horses and cars. Yeah. So I'll say that tongue right. in cheek, but I do think that's quite a typo area. That's where, that's where the bus company got the same thing. At this moment in time, I'm going to listen to what other candidates say, um, and then I will come to a decision about the tilted backs. Thank you, <coughs> you Councillor Locke. <clears throat> well, from my point of view, if you want to see the destruction of Angel Woodland, you want to vote to support this application because that's what will happen. Um, it's already been mentioned that it's going to have pathways for it for the public to use. There's no access to it for the public in that wonderful wildlife area, which should be retained in my view. But some of it will be fenced. If you've got whatever wildlife's there now, won't be there within five years of any housing being built close by, I could almost guarantee that. And I was a bit intrigued reading on page 104 about all this about the costs for the junction with Buckley Road, but that's almost been completed now. Traffic lights are there, street lighting's up. Um, why they should be asking for money towards that beyond me? Uh, it's almost, it's almost, it must be out of date now. Um, I've got plenty of policy reasons why we, why this can be refused. Badgers, Badgers Hill Wood is woodland priority habitat, page 111. And according to the information submitted, designated as a site of nature conservation interest. This, is, for this for me throughout this report, throughout the application is what matters, is the destruction or potential destruction of this wonderful wildlife asset close to the centre of the river. We all know that it, without this five year housing land supply, which we can't currently, this wouldn't have put anywhere near getting approved for planning. Um, I know some of the, some of the uh, comments from people talk about lack of community consultation on this particular latest application. And then when you look at the, the county officer, uh, on page 131 at the bottom, development in the most visually sensitive northwest and western areas. I previously stated that I do not consider that the site offers capacity to accommodate development in these areas. The proposal to make these areas single story would make no difference. The site would still have an urban developed character as opposed to an undeveloped green character, so would not address this fundamental issue. And that really is, for me, the core of this, of my objections to this site, is that you will be changing what is now a wonderful wildlife area close to Biddeford which, as Councillor Chris has pointed out, I think we all know, going over to Kenmith Viaduct, you look across, the big sheep have got their sign there about the activities, and you see the site behind. And it is a wonderful green site with 
the coombe the valley with the ancient woodland in it and this application would destroy all that there's no doubt and it's a key route through to Kenneth valley for wildlife to cross over north down road which actually it's not a road it's a very narrow lane along there and it is very prone to flooding currently because i know i've driven into it in the dark before then um, so I'm going to be opposed to this, and I'm going to move that his refusal on it. And I've got some of the reasons listed here. Um, it's contrary to me, contrary to MPPF 174, little a and b, MPPF 180c, little c, ST14 of our local plan, enhancing environmental assets on page 58 there at G, Little G, I and D, <laughs> DMOA, biodiversity and geodiversity, little bracket seven, ancient woodland, on page 4421 of our local plan here. So, for those reasons, looking at the tilted balance, which we've got, is the main consideration for this. It's open countryside, and the tilted balance for me is far too damaging. To the environment to allow it to happen, and that's that is really the nub of it for me. But I'll leave it at that tonight. Councillor Pist is seconded that reasons for refusal. Councillor Watson. Yes, Chair. Um, I'm afraid that I can't agree with what you've just said. Uh, one for me, we've just approved a site uh, where everybody's been screaming about. Affordable houses. 13 on that side. This side got 44. Now, if, do, do we want affordable housing or not? So, and, and for me, I think the tilt, tilted balance is in favour of, of this application. I, I understand about wildlife. I live around wildlife. So, so yeah, I'm, I, I can't agree with it. I'm not going really, Proposed that we approve it. I'll second. That's, uh, that's an alternative proposal. Councillor Ball. It was just a comment on the um, um, affordable housing side of it. Now, if I'm reading this right, it talks about the residual land value of 10 times the agricultural value. Um, so they put the agricultural value at 10,000 pounds an acre, which is about right. Um, now, if this land is outside of the development boundary anyway, how can it actually be deemed to be worth 10 times agricultural value? Um, so I would have thought that, I mean, if, if, if some of my, if I was offered 10 times what my land is worth to put buildings on it, I would think that was, that was wonderful. So um, given that, you know, given that this is outside of the development boundary anyway, how, how does that work 10 times the agricultural value? And if that was, if that was like you could take some money off that to put that towards affordable housing, I would have thought, then you would still be left with a good, you know, a, a good whack of money. Fine, really. Well, I don't think there's any, that's just what it's been valued at, I suppose. It, it is a big up left, I know. But to pick up on Councillor Watson's point, and he compared it with the previous application. The previous, previous application is in our local plan. The whole site is in our local plan. This is open countryside on the edge of Biddeford, and it's a very valuable green space close to Biddeford. And you've heard, you'll see all the comments on the website, the objections, a lot of objections to it, making these very points that I did about the loss of the ecology and biodiversity. And the wildlife corridor that this provides through down to Kenwith Valley. And it is all interlinked, like as Mr. Sims uh, alluded to that, that it is all linked. So, you know, on balance, we shouldn't be allowing development on a site like that, taking into account that they're offering uh, the affordable element on there. But just across the road from this site, across Abbotson Road, there is 71 hectares. Of land in our local plan for development, for a mixed development, for housing and business use. So we're not actually short of sites to be brought forward for development 
currently in our local plan without going into open country. So, Council no. So, I, I won't disagree with that last statement because we all know that we've got to look what is in front of us. You cannot think we've got 75 acres that might be developed in the next 10 years. We've got to consider what's in front of us. And we further know that if there's one objection or a thousand objections, it's immaterial. And as long as the an application fits planning policy, that's what you should make a decision on, not on the number of objections or presentations. Well, I, I, I don't make my decisions on the number of objections. It's just, just a point. Just, you just stress how many objections there were. Because yeah. it, it is a point when you when we sit here on behalf of the public, look at these planning applications. I did, I did read all of them. Yeah, I do. When we sit here on behalf of the public looking at planning applications, it does matter how many applications are, how many objections or letters of support come in. And it does matter to the planning reasons that they raise in those objections or in their support. It matters. And it matters to me that many of those objections have been in line with what I've been saying about the loss of this site. And that, and for me, it's detrimental to the area to lose a greenfield site with ancient woodland in it. Like that. Anyway, we've had two, um, two proposals. The first proposal was that this is refused, and I did give the reasons. I can go over them again if you like. And Councillor Christie seconded. So, Kirsty, will you take the vote on that, please, to refuse? Yes, thank you, Chair. Councillor Bowden. Against. Councillor Brown. Councillor Christie. For. Councillor Craigie. For. Councillor Leather. For. Councillor Locke. Against. Councillor McGough. For. Councillor Watson. Against. Councillor Wiseman. Against. So that's four, four chair, and five again. I did five, four, and four again. Four, four, and five again. Right, okay. Right, all right, so we go to the second vote, which is to approve this, um, which was proposed by Councillor Watson. Secondly, by Councillor Lowe. So, could you take the vote on that to approve this? Thing, please? Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bowden. For. Councillor Brown. Councillor Christie. Against. Councillor Craigie. Against. Councillor Leather. Against. Councillor Locke. For. Councillor McGough. Against. Councillor Watson. For. Councillor Wiseman. For. So that's four, four. Chair and five again. Yeah, well, I, I'm convinced, I'm pretty sure that the first vote was five four. No, 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 it's not, Chair. That's the same vote again. That vote was lost five four. Yeah. So yeah. This, that vote is lost to approve this. Oh, that vote No, no, it's just been lost to, to approve it. That's, that's the last vote as well. What are we doing now, Chair? Sorry, that was the last vote. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I just voted. This. Yeah, just to clarify, I had the same result as, as Kirsty. So for the first one, we had four, four, and five against, so that motion was lost. And for the second one, we had four, four, and five against, so that motion was, was lost as well. Was so which point? motion stands? The last one or the one? No, but they've both, both been voted against. Yes, but the last vote was the, the last vote. The last one was to approve, and it was. <laughs> yeah, it was, yes. Yeah. And, and the first one, and the motion to refuse was lost by more as well. I don't understand that. Statement. Someone obviously changed their mind. Yeah, that, that's right. We've had a, yeah, we've had a, there was a change here. So I, I've got a record of that's Kirsty as to who's voted um, for. And again, for both application, we have had a switch in between the, the applications. Sure. I thought we had Councillor Brown originally, myself, Councillor Christie, Councillor McGough, and Councillor Craig. That was five. Okay, Kirsty, do you start? That was to refuse. Mark, 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 Mark,
Capital Brown voted against the first. Oh, right. The first one. Right. Okay. Chair, yeah. 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 sure. I've been chairman of Torridge and I've been in I thought under our constitution, the last vote was the one that stood. But the motion was last, so it, it was the second one was for approval. No, the second one, the second one for approval was lost. Yes, yeah. the first one for refusal yeah. was lost as well. But surely the second vote being the final vote must be the one that stands. Well, yeah, it's not that it's in the mm -hmm. And for I don't understand that at all. I'm going to take time out and I'm going to get to the topic. Sorry. It doesn't make sense at all. Chair, whilst we're waiting, can we just vote to continue the meeting because we're up to 12 20? We will. I'll propose we continue the meeting, seconded by Councillor Christie. Can we vote to extend the meeting, please? Question just uh, you'll have to ask everybody to vote on that. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You want me to do Councillor Watson, Councillor Brown. Councillor Brown. Councillor Craigie. Councillor Craigie. Councillor Lever. Four. Councillor Lock. Four. Councillor Lock. Four. Councillor Watson. He's left the room, he can't take part in the vote now. Pass. Councillor Wiseman. Thank you, just unanimous chair. Thank you, Kirsten. Yeah, we we'll just have a, sh a short break for two minutes. While the legal Before, because somebody changed their mind and decided they weren't going to approve it. It's as simple as that. Councillor McGoffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Just, I, I don't know. We've had two votes, Kate. There's no clarity with it at the moment. So why don't we just take those two votes again to get pure clarity? Everyone's in the room. And uh, Councillor, <coughs> Councillor Brown's decided to change their mind. With whatever way, which way she wants to go, you know, you can't put pressure on anybody, but we're not clear. We haven't come to a decisive decision at the moment. So why can't you just take the first vote again and take the second vote? Mindful, they, they create the, the clarity we need. Mindful that this is being broadcast on you. Yeah, the public to keep chopping and changing. No, so that's for transparency, surely. We're a stem, mate. What do we do? We run better. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Tracy too. Take it to appeal. Well, no, that's, that smacks of some organization this country used to belong to where you keep voting until you get the right result. No, it is I think the last vote stands, isn't that yeah, the same? Just an amendment, isn't it? Your vote comes second, that's the one you can. They've changed it from Thursday to Wednesday. 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 
to refuse it for me, but with the addition over and above what was mentioned before of the wider landscape impact that this development would have um, in the area, that is an additional reason uh, over and above what was said when I first proposed to refuse it. And we can vote on that, on that proposal. Can you repeat that please? Oh, sorry, Margaret. Can you repeat that please? I can't. Repeat it, please. Yeah, it, it, would be, it would be to refuse with the reasons originally given up with the additional ones of the, um, the effect of the development on the wider landscape, which wasn't mentioned when I first, in the first refusal that was put forward. So how do we legally negate that first two votes then? Well, because they've, they've cancelled each other out. So we're left, we're left in the middle without a firm decision. Oh. One way or the other. So I'm proposing that the additional landscape issue is added into the reason to refuse. And we vote on that then. So, so Chair, Chair, how can we start adding things to something that we've already taken? Because it's a fresh on just a minute, yeah, I, I've explained it's yeah. a fresh, it's a fresh proposal this on it. It's a fresh proposal, it's additional reasons for refusal. Mr. Chairman, I think we're creating a very dangerous precedent. We well, are, we are this is the advice I've received. It may be the advice, but always before, if you put an amendment or a direct opposition to a motion, it's the last vote that counts. I'm sorry, but you know, if you start saying, yes, we can rerun it, it creates all sorts of. Mr. Points. Chairman, on a point of order, um, please, my the solicitor, to clarify, please, before we proceed any further. I, I accept what members are saying. The, the difficulty that you've got, so we've had a, a motion to refuse the application that wasn't carried, and the votes for that was four or five. 
and then you had a contrary motion to approve but again that wasn't carried that the votes for for that were four and it was five again so we are in, in limbo it hasn't been approved and it hasn't been refused both the motions that were put forward haven't been approved by members so i understand what you're saying councillor christie but it, it hasn't been approved at this stage it hasn't been refused so um members are entitled to put forward an amendment to a motion now but other than that we're, we're in limbo at this stage i, I don't understand that I accept both votes, but we, we, we vote to send it to... I'm, I'm, going to make, I'm going to make the chairman's decision on this. The last vote stands. This application has been refused because it was refused approval on the last vote. And, and, and as far as the committee is concerned, the last vote is what counts. Right. Otherwise, we can, get legal otherwise we can keep chopping and changing all the way through. If, an, if, if an extra conditions put forward to refuse, there might be an extra condition put forward then to approve it. And we we'll keep going backwards and forwards. And I do think the last vote, obviously one of the committee members decided to change their mind and they couldn't support approval. Therefore, it's failed and it's not been approved in my book. I'm going to move on and leave it at that. This has been refused because approval was refused. Sure. Yeah, I think you're correct. Sorry, I think you're correct. But can I go back to something I raised about the applicant is also the owner of the land, and yet in their viability study, they put the the sale of the land against the viability in the viability studies of cost. They they want their cake and eat it. Is that how, what is the legal standing on that? Check what you're not giving legal advice. Just like we minutes. are going to get forced to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, all right. Well, we're short break for five minutes. Yeah, you need to vote to go into part two. Yeah. Yeah. Is Tom as huge as you? No, we need to vote to go into part two. Yeah. 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 We've got to go into part two, apparently, now for some legal advice, which is confidential for legal advice. I don't like going into part two at the Plans Committee, but I think it's the first time we've ever done for a long time. So I'll move that we do go into part two. Um, somebody wants to second that. Councillor Craig is second it. Can we take a vote, Kirsty, to go into part two? Thanks, the Chair. Councillor Bowson? Or. Councillor Brown? Or. Councillor Christie? Or. Councillor Craigie? Or. Councillor Lever? Or. Councillor Locke? Or. Councillor McGough? I'm against. I want this in the public domain. So there's no comeback to any of us. Mm -hmm. Councillor Watson? I'm against. Councillor Wiseman? Against. 